Good evening. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed to the Council's online webcast channel. That members use the raise your hand option when you wish to speak. You will be given permission to unmute from Democratic Services. If members wish to raise a point of order, they are to do so via the chat function where Demo Democratic Services can see it and advise me accordingly. I would now like to ask Reverend Canon Darren Barlow to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On this day, the 24th of February in 1955, Steve Jobs, the American entrepreneur, inventor and business person was born. He was, of course, the co-founder, chairman and chief executive of Apple and also CEO and the largest shareholder of Pixar Animation Studios. And if you've got children of a similar age to mine, you'll be very familiar with the Pixar films. But in addition to those two things, he was also a member of the Walt Disney Company's board of directors following its acquisition of Pixar. Jobs is widely recognised as a pioneer of the microcomputer. Uh, this took place mostly in the 1970s and was undertaken along with the Apple co-founder, Steve Wozniak. Shortly after his death in October 2011, Jobs' official biographer, Walter Isaacson, described him as the creative entrepreneur whose passion for perfection and ferocious drive revolutionised six different industries, personal computers, animated movies, music, phones, which created the iPhone and the smartphones that most of us are probably using heavily at the moment, tablet computing and digital publishing. And I suspect that there are very few people here this evening whose lives have not been affected by one or more of these innovations or industries over the past 45 years or so. Unlike two of my daughters, I don't have an iPhone, but it's suggested by many that within the industry that all of today's smartphones have in part their origin within Apple's ability to reinvent, think big and to think outside the box. Well, what's this got to do with the council meeting this evening? But I think that the challenges that the council face as it looks towards the future in terms of setting budgets and setting priorities as we hopefully come out of lockdown and return to some sort of new normal, will need all of its members from across the chamber to be able to think big and outside the box. If that is the members' goal this evening, then clearly the best results will be achieved for all whom you serve as elected members. So a short prayer. Father God, we commit this evening, this evening's meeting to you and our service to the people of this borough. Amen. Thank you, uh, Reverend Canon Darren Barlow, and uh, thank you for being my chaplain um, over my last period of uh, being mayoral ship. It's uh, been good to have you on board. So thank you. Obviously, you uh, can leave the meeting now if you wish, or by all means, uh, stay online. <laughs> now move to item one on the agenda, which is apologies for absence. I have received an apology from Councillor Baker. Are there any other apologies? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Not, not so much of an apology, more of an outline. Uh, Councillor Maney uh, has said he's having a bit of a problem trying to connect, uh, and uh, I'm just waiting for another one to confirm they're having the same problem, but they will be here as soon as they possibly can. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we, evidently we now have them uh, online, so they, are, they have managed to connect. Moving on to item two, 
I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 27th of January 2021 be approved as a correct record as shown on pages 9 to 32 of the agenda. Is that seconded? Uh, Councillor Gettle, thank you. Uh, second, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Mark Dope still has our hand raised, by the way. Is any, me is any member in disagreement with the accuracy of the minutes? In that case, the minutes are approved. Moving on to item three, items of urgent business. I have not agreed to any urgent items of business. Item four, are there any declarations of interest to be made? <laughs> Moving on to item five, announcements on behalf of the Mayor and Leader of the Council. I would like us to take a moment and remember Thurrock's Fallen of World War II on page seven of the agenda. The names being... Horace F. French, Ernest G. Stammers, Norman H. Hawkins, and Edwin George Hathaway. I'll now move on to my announcements. I will keep my keep my announcements brief as I'm aware we have a full agenda tonight. Again this month I've not been able to attend any functions or meet with any thorough based groups or businesses which is disappointing. My hope is that before the end of my time as Mayor I will once again be able to attend such functions but it is looking very unlikely. This month I have continued to make donations to thorough based groups from my mayoral, mayoral allowance as I feel this is only just under the current circumstances. As I said, I will keep my announcements brief. I would just like to end by thanking all councillors for their service over the last year and wish those that are standing for re-election in May all the very best. As this is my last full council meeting as Mayor and a very busy one at that, I would appreciate if we can all keep our questions and answers brief and succinct. With that, I will now hand over to the Leader of the Council for his announcements. Councillor Gledhill. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. Um, I have managed to protect my voice as we go through. I'm sure everyone in the borough will welcome the Prime Minister's announcement that there's now a clear plans in place uh, which will see us move from the current national lockdown to be able to, to better enjoy greater freedoms as we go through the year. It's welcome light at the end of the tunnel for all of, our in, all of us in our borough and we've worked hard uh, to follow government guidance and successfully help lower the infection rate in Thurrock. The roadmap will see schools opening um, on the 8th of March, on essential shops, gyms and beer gardens on the 12th of April, pubs and restaurants on the 17th of May and hopefully everything back to as near as normal as we can expect on the 21st of June. Um, with tremendous strides, um, we, sorry, we've made tremendous strides in fighting and slowing and halting the spread of this infection locally, but it's important that we continue to do so uh, to see those huge reductions we've had since uh, December uh, continue. We've moved away from being the highest uh, infection rate in the country, uh, but the strain is still there on our local NHS. Um, indeed, they're still dealing with more patients than they did at the peak of the coronavirus in April and May last year. So it's crucial that we continue to stay at home um, as the uh, stay at home order is still legally in place until the 29th of March. If you're clinically extremely vulnerable, you should remain at home until the 31st of March at least. Um, and now is the time to make sure we double down on this, make sure we do everything we can to not give the virus a chance and to get everything back on track and get all those shops open, the high streets back and viable, and indeed so we can all get to the hairdressers. The national vaccination programme has been a huge success, uh, not just nationally, but locally. Uh, we don't have the figures locally as yet, although we do push uh, for those every single week. 
Um, the vaccination rate at the moment is just over 18 million people uh, nationally, with nearly three quarters of a million uh, of those receiving their second uh, dose as of today. Um, I'm going to move very quickly on to the uh, uh, numbers that we have. Um, so far, as of uh, the information today, um, under 18s is um, up to 31 from 18 uh, last week. 18 to 49 year olds is down from 126 to 106. 50 to 59 year olds down from 47 to 25. 60 to 69 is up, unfortunately, from 14 to 20. Uh, and those over 70 is down from 18 to 15. Um, it's clear that still, you know, more, still more needs to be done. Uh, we still need to uh, follow uh, all the guidance, um, stay at home and practice hands, face, space at all times. Our local authority ranking, which was one, as we uh, can remember uh, in uh, December, is now down to 81 uh, as of this week. Um, there's been uh, a few requests in relation to uh, potholes. I'm uh, pleased to announce that we've filled a staggering 3,380 potholes across Thurrock uh, in uh, the financial year this year. Um, there's also been only just under 200 reported potholes not meeting the criteria to be filled. But I would urge residents to continue to report potholes to the council so it can be assessed. Putting it on social media, unfortunately, will not mean it will come to the council. So please uh, log on to the council website and report them. Pothole filling isn't the only thing that we do to uh, improve the roads. Uh, we've done 37 capital resurfacing programmes this year, which has delivered 90 kilometres of new road surface, which are a, a metre wide, which is roughly a straight road, one metre wide from Grays to Brighton Pier. Um, pleased to say that the keys of the remaining homes at Claudian Way have been handed over as part of the council's investment in new council homes for affordable rent for people on the borough's housing register. The new development at Chapel St Mary offers 53 homes, including apartments, houses and bungalows, three of which are fully wheelchair accessible. The high quality homes follow the Alma Court development and provided 29 much needed council homes last year and uh, will be followed by another 35 flats specifically designed to meet the needs of the older residents in the borough and Calcutta Road in Tilbury. I would again ask all those small and medium sized builders who wish to work for Thurr to deliver small site developments to contact us so we can work in partnership to deliver more council homes for those who truly need it. Uh, very briefly, last week we did um, use uh, some of the money from the £524,000 the government gave us COVID-19 winter support grant uh, to ensure that all of those children um, who are in receipt of free school meals received the £15 worth of supermarket vouchers um, for everyone eligible across the borough. This follows on from us delivering the vouchers through the two week Christmas holiday and a total of 1, 000, sorry, 17,400 vouchers have been used during uh, both uh, breaks. Uh, with this being the last full council of the year, and um, as we know, we have a number of uh, councils retiring, retiring, and as the mayor alluded to, um, obviously I'd like to pass on my thanks for all those who are not seeking uh, re-election, um, there are too many to name, um, and indeed uh, for all those that are uh, seeking re-election, obviously we wish you well uh, in your endeavours. So with that, Mr Mayor, um, I thank you for your indulgence, um, and that ends my speech. Thank you, Councillor Weddle. Moving on to item six, questions from members of the public. No, pub, no public questions have been received. Item seven, petitions from members of the public and, and councillors. Please be advised that in accordance with the council's petition scheme, no notice of petition were received. Item eight, update report in respect of those petitions presented at council and council offices. This report can be found on pages 35 to 36 of the agenda and is information on the stat status of petitions handed in at council meetings and council offices. We now move on to item nine, which is appointments to, community, to committees and outside bodies, statutory and other panels. Councillor Gledel, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? Uh, excuse me for uh, coughing there, Mr. Mayor. I think I was on mute. 
no, I, I have no changes for, for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? No, but again, once again, Councillor Gledhill made his speech and my hand's been up, but are you not allowed to answer any of his questions because we're on mute again? So we're our, our freedom, our, there isn't Councillor Council. our, our freedom of speech. Our freedom of speech is taken away again. Councillor Byrne, there isn't questions while the uh, leader is making his statement. It's a statement. It's not something that can be questioned. Thank you. Councillor Macy, do you do you wish to make a, any changes to the appointments previously made? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor Allen, do you wish to make any changes to any appointments previously made? No changes, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Now moving on to item 10 of the agenda, which is the Assistant Director of Housing Management Recruitment. Councillor Geddell, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 37 to 40. Members have also been sent a completed version of this report. Councillor Geddell, you have five minutes. Would you please uh, make your Thank you for your indulgence there, Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got it down as uh, uh, Councillor Johnson to uh, deliver this report. Um, I believe he's been prepped and has uh, been waiting all day to do so. Thank you. It's obviously my uh, my notes are incorrect there. Then, then could Councillor Johnson please uh, deliver the report? Can you uh, please unmute, um, Councillor Johnson? Sorry, I thought you had control of the mute button. I do beg your pardon. Um, I presume you all have seen the emailed update to this item, which the Mayor referred to, which was sent to all members yesterday at 16.32pm. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, Thorat continues to attract such a good number of high-quality candidates is very encouraging, as this recommendation itself arises from a total of 11 candidates. I would, however, like to begin by putting on record my sincere thanks to the departing Assistant Director, Carol Himvest. Carol joined the council around the same time as I started my third term as a councillor, and I remember spending the first few days travelling around the borough, getting to know the council housing staff and properties, which was a very enjoyable experience, and I look forward to being able to do that again very soon. But since then, Carol has worked tirelessly in her role and has certainly overseen or been involved with getting other areas of the council to work very closely with housing. So I hope you will all join me in wishing her the very best of luck in her new venture when she leaves in March. Just for the record, I can confirm that we have had an interim assistant director in place since February 22nd, which should ensure a smooth handover of the reins to our recommended appointee as the new permanent assistant director of housing management, which is one Evelina Sojan, who, if agreed here this evening, will be a very capable and imaginative new member of the housing leadership team, who I look forward to working with in continuing to take our housing services to the next level. I would also like to give my thanks to the consultants and our HR staff for setting the interview process up, and of course the stakeholder panel and general services committee for making it possible to bring this report to you this evening. Happy to take any questions, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to speak? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? Yes, I'd just like to say with, um, with what's coming ahead with the 5% increase, do we really have to replace staff at 100 grand a year? Have you, have you never heard of muck? Have you never heard of, have you never heard of mucking in? And everybody um, save 100 grand a year? It's what, what you would do in the commercial world. So why do we not? Why are we not doing this? Why are we? Thank you, thank you, Councillor Boone. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Do you wish to speak? 
I don't need to echo the words of Councillor Johnson, Mr Mayor, and wish Carol all the best in her new venture. Thank you. And Councillor Allen, do you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd just like to uh, pass on my, my wishes to Carol Himvest uh, and wish all the best for the future. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Would any member like to speak on this report? Councillor Gledhall, first, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just really to echo uh, what's already been said and to thank uh, Carol for all of her hard work since she's arrived here. Um, she has been a great addition to the team. Um, obviously, housing you know, does affect one in six houses in the borough. Uh, so it's quite a significant number of people that rely on the, the housing service. Uh, and it's right to have uh, someone at the head of it to uh, steer all the many aspects of it, because it doesn't just sit in the HRA, it also sits into the general fund. Uh, and I know Evelina, um, from being part of the interview panel, will be able to easily manage that. Um, as Councillor Johnson said, absolutely fantastic, high-class uh, candidates all the way through. All those that we in interviewed were equally uh, fantastic. Um, it was a difficult decision, um, but uh, Evelina just uh, picked the post there. Um, I really can't wait uh, to, for her to uh, start. She's a bit of breath of fresh air. Uh, not that Carol hasn't been, um, but obviously each new head brings a whole new different um, set of skills. And I think it will be uh, for the benefit of uh, Thurrock and indeed all the residents uh, who rely on us. Councillor Redshaw. Councillor Redshaw. Just to let you know, Councillor Redshaw, we are uh, unmuting you at the moment. Yeah, you, should be able to unmute. you should be able to unmute now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry about that. Um, not always our fault, I don't think. Um, just like to thank Carol for all her hard work. She's been a director that's always been available and always really answers her phone. So I think the help that she's given me um, over the last couple of years um, and all the time she's been here has been great. So I wish her well wherever she's going and she'll do very well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cockshaw, I understand you'd like to speak. Yes, yeah, it's, um, I'm, I'd like, like to raise a point that Councillor Berners had pointed out there. We've, with what my leader has just mentioned, that nearly 11,000 homes with an event, with a, a progressive policy of actually building more uh, council homes for people on a waiting list and making sure we've got a home for everyone who can have a reasonable house, uh, a reasonable rent. Um, it's really important at this AD role we actually deliver this. And so I can't see we can't keep, there's some roles that we're really are critical to this. And I see Deliver, making sure our housing stock are good quality and new housings are really important for us. The only, also the item is, it's a shame you didn't come to the interview Ca panel. Councillor Coxall, uh, Councillor Coxall, can we uh, call it to an end there because uh, it's not actually relevant to the... He didn't uh, turn up. He didn't turn no, up. I, I, I'm sorry about that. We'll call it to an end on that. And Councillor Spillman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to, again to echo uh, many thanks to Carol. Um, she was, I think, she, there's no doubt that she left the when she's left the department in a better shape than when she arrived at Thorough Council. Um, she was always very engaging, uh, very uh, to the point, uh, never sugarcoated anything, and um, was a very honest officer as well. So I do uh, wish her all the best in her next role, and I look forward to working uh, closely with the new appointment. Councillor Warren. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to just say thank you to Carol. Um, I spent um, a long time with her as the chair of scrutiny. Um, she's been fair. We've had our battles, um, it's fair to say, but she's always um, kept um, very professional in all of those meetings, and I'm sure that she'll be an asset to wherever it is that she's been going, that she's decided to go to. So, um, thank you, Carol, for all the work that you've done here in Thorough. Being the housing director is never, ever easy, wherever council you are in, um, and Thorough um, obviously has 
its challenges and um, she's been a good um, officer so um, I wish her well. Thank you. Um, I will now proceed to the recommendation. Oh, sorry, Councillor Gledel, do you wish to sum up, although I... Oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Johnson. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I don't think there's much more to say on the report. I think that just to echo which Councillor Cockshill said, this is a very, very important assistant director and we, you know, we, we really did have to go through and make sure we had a, a suitable candidate to take over. But other than that, um, Mr Mayor, I put the report to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I will now proceed to the recommendation. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendation made? No. We then move on to item 11, which is the annual pay policy statement. Councillor Hewlin, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 41 to 60? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the report I'm presenting tonight is the pay policy statement for 2021 to 2022. The pay policy reflects existing employment terms and conditions. The pay policy covered by this report is completely separate to the pay review and does not govern the pay review. That falls under the remit of the General Services Committee. Under the Localism Act of 2011, we're legally required to publish an annual pay policy setting out arrangements for chief officers by the end of March. And we've always extended this to include other staff categories. Members will recall the new pay structure implemented in 2019, removed the direct link with the National Pay Award. Thorough Council's collective agreement enables the Council to come to a locally agreed decision with recognised trade unions and the council also maintains commitment to commission an annual independent assessment to ensure council structure remains competitive. For staff, the council also takes into account the National Joint Council for Local Government, NJC, budget availability and the UK living wage, while senior management is governed by the pay strategy and policy for assistant director and director posts as agreed back in 2009 and determined by the annual independent market assessment. Pay negotiations with trade unions for 21 and 22 have not yet commenced. The independent pay review commissioned by council recommends that thorough council with effect from April 2021 implement a pay freeze and point 1.1 1 .1 of this report is asking for the annual pay policy statement to be agreed in line with this assessment together with the output of the pay review project as agreed by the general services committee on the 8th of october 2018 and the collective agreement Whilst this means no increase this year, it's important to say that we will be maintaining our transition plan to the new pay scale grades. And so the majority of staff will continue to benefit from a pay increase this year via pay scale increments. Plus, thanks to phase one of the pay review, many will benefit from increased maximum salaries by the reduction of legroom and a faster track to maximum salary via a reduction in the number of incremental points. Historically, the chief exec salary in relation to the average workforce salary was at a ratio of 1.8, meaning the salary was eight times higher than that of the average staff salary. This gap has reduced to uh, six in 2021-22, meaning the average workforce salaries are increasing at a greater rate than exec positions. The lowest entry pay grade on the scale is what we call a thorough living wage and at £9.24 an hour it's important to note that this is still higher than the national living wage of £8.91 for those over 23 and £6.56 for those aged 18 to 20 plus in line with the Chancellor's pay review of November 2020 we are recommending an increase of £250 to all salaries under £24,000 a year this will see a further investment of 300,000 in the lowest paid employees subject to reaching agreement with trade unions during phase two of the pay review. We'll continue to value our apprentices. We want to ensure we remain attractive as a prospective employer and use the apprentice levy to great effect. 
These are our future experienced officers, ensuring Tharrock residents are in safe hands. For this reason, we are recommending we continue to maintain the national living wage appropriate to their age from the start of employment. For example, £8.91 an hour, age 23, rather than the much lower national minimum wage or the apprentice rate of £4.30 an hour for the first six months. I note Councillor Kent's amendment. I cannot believe you of all people would suggest we apply pay changes without consulting unions and reaching an agreement with them. That totally goes against the collective agreement that your party and unions agreed to, so no, I don't agree to the amendment. The Council are keen to reward our lowest paid staff and have recommended that in the report, but the behaviour of one of our recognised trade unions has put the repayment of the 800,000 um, and collective agreement at risk. Therefore, we are not prepared to place any further pressure on the budget until the agreement has been honoured. We are not asking for the money to have been repaid, just agreement how that will be done whilst bringing some of our very outdated allowances into the 21st century. This report as it stands is an excellent way forward, ensuring we continue to invest in our frontline front line staff and lowest paid workers, for this reason, I ask the Chamber to agree the recommendations as already stated in points 1.1 and 1.2 of this report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to speak and refer to your proposed amendment to recommendation 1.2? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I will uh, move my uh, amendment to, to 1.2. The amendment removes the words subject to reaching agreement with the trade unions on phase two of the pay review. And Mr Mayor, for me, this is nothing more or less than a matter of fairness. Our, low paid, our lowest paid workers deserve a pay rise. There's no ifs, no buts. They deserve a pay rise. They deserve a pay rise now. Uh, and to link it to the outcome of phase two of the pay review is simply not fair. This is a threat to our lower paid workers. Mr Mayor, we've seen, as Councillor Fulham has suggested, much speculation on the impact of this pay review. Uh, Unite the Trade Union tell us that documents that have been shared with them suggest that frontline workers, such as street cleaners or refuse workers, could lose the equivalent of £3,500 a year. Uh, they tell us that care workers could lose up to £8,000 a year. Mr Mayor, I've asked to see the documents on which that's based, uh, but so far no documents have been shared with me. Can Councillor Hewin, when she uh, when she responds, tell us how those eight hundred thousand pounds of reduction of allowances are made up? Can she tell us which very outdated allowances, as she suggested, uh, would go to, to to make up this this eight hundred thousand pounds? And finally, Mr. Mayor, how does the portfolio holder justify, uh, on one hand, holding a gun to the head of our lowest paid workers over a five pounds a week pay rise? at the same time as allowing an increase in the number of officers earning £100,000 or more to rise from five in 2017-18 to 18 today, an increase of 260%, whilst at the same time officers earning over £50,000 have risen from 109 to 176 at the same time. As I say, Mr Mayor, this is an issue of fairness. Our lowest paid workers deserve a pay rise. They deserve it now. No ifs. No buts. Thank you. Do you have a seconder for? Do we have a seconder for Councillor John Kent's amendment to recommendation one point two? Please indicate by raising your electronic hand. Councillor Kerry. 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 Councillor Kerry, would you like to speak now, or reserve your right to speak until later in the debate? I reserve my right, Mr Moore. Thank you. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? Oh, yes. Uh, I put my hand up to second, JK, but um, he put it very nicely, but I'll put it bluntly, you're shafting our lower paid workers, aren't you? And the £250 flat rate, I've never, ever known any worker that's happy to have their differentials eroded. Somebody on 18000 a year is getting a bigger rise than somebody on 24,000 a year. That is not, I've never known any 
worker to accept erosion of their differentials. Next thing is, John Kent has just put it so, so well. It's um, oh, so shafted, but you can put it on any way you like, but it is despicable the way you are treating. When, and he's so, why didn't I go to the interviews? I'm not, I've sat on interviews for a million pounds worth of salaries when we have got those lower paid workers walking about in wet boots and they can't afford to even put food on the table. So this is John Kay, JK 100% with him, million percent. Thank you. Councillor Massey, do you wish to speak? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Arnon, do you wish to speak? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to echo what Councillor Kent has said. We really need to be looking at the lowest paid employees, our staff, and they thoroughly deserve a pay rise. Uh, I'm not so sure that the, uh, the senior officers on the higher salaries, I'm not saying that they're not deserving, uh, but I think we should be certainly looking at the lowest paid before we start increasing the huge salaries of the much higher paid. Thank you. Thank you. Would any member like to speak on this report? Oh. Councillor Howden. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. I'm terribly confused by the statement just given by Councillor Allen and Councillor Kent. You're talking about we need to absolutely guarantee that our lowest paid workers are paid more. Councillor Hoolin has tabled a paper that is literally in front of you that is to do precisely that. We wish to pay our lower paid workers more. That, that is the paper under Councillor Hoolin's name that is tabled in front of us. I don't see any reason for why we can't come to an amicable rule agreement reasonably with the trade unions. So the, the very fact that we've got a Labour leader who, who used the phrase holding a gun to the head, why on earth would be working with trade unions holding a gun to anybody's head? I, I think the Labour Party have far less uh, faith in our unions than I seem to. We all want to pay our lower paid workers more. That is what Councillor Houdin has tabled this evening. Um, members seem to be making a bit of heavy, heavy weather over nothing. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Muldoney. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to speak in support of um, Councillor Kent's amendment. I don't think there's any need for Councillor Howden to be confused. Um, if he's so confident that the unions are going to reach an agreement, then there's absolutely no need to be tying up the £250 increase with um, the union agreement. Um, so I'm not really sure what kind of point he's making there. I agree. We should just do it, not subject to any conditions whatsoever. These are the people that have worked on the front line during COVID and we should be giving them this pay rise at the very least. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I, like Councillor Haldham, um, was confused as to why um, the, um, the Labour group appear not to be supporting a pay rise for some of our lowest paid workers. I'm even more confused after Councillor Muldoney has just, just spoken. She appears to be questioning whether the unions will actually um, agree to this, um, which seems a very bizarre situation to be, that we've got a, a Labour councillor questioning um, what the unions might actually do and support a pay rise for low paid workers. So. Um, slightly confused, will be supporting the paper because I want to see our lowest paid workers in the borough paid more money. And I would urge trade unions to agree to it so that we can pay our low paid workers more money. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. We now move to uh, Councillor Kerrin, if you'd like to uh, now second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think what we have here is a situation where 
uh, the administration are feigning uh, confusion when what we're saying is we are having no conditions put onto this pay rise, no ifs, no buts. These lowest paid workers have been the heroes throughout the, the, the COVID um, situation that we've had for over a year now. So the only confusion I can see is why conditions are put on the lowest paid workers, but conditions are not put on the increase of the workers over £100,000 a year and £50,000 a year. So therefore, I second Councillor Kent's amendment, and I urge all elected members to do the same. Thank you. Councillor Hewlin, do you wish to sum up? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll just reiterate again, all, all of these things are about the pay review um, that you're talking about, which is completely separate to the pay policy that is under my portfolio. And what you're talking about is actually governed by the General Services Committee, of which Labour and the independents and everybody are part of, and you've all agreed to. Now, I've got a copy of the collective agreement here that is signed by the unions and it's gone past all parties at the General Services Committee. Now the £800,000 additional investment in the employee budget came with an agreement, this one, signed by everybody, that it would be repaid from the employee budget. Staff are not going to lose out. Under 3.1, under the document that you've all agreed to, it says, that um, staff, uh, let me just find the actual point so I can read it in its entirety to you. The cap. I won't be a second because I just really want to like make sure that I, I can see it here for you and it's in there. It's the third point under 3.1. It says commitment to no reduction in base pay. It also it goes on to say that the unions asked for this investment to be brought forward into the first year. And it, it's now time for us to work on the antiquated allowances. Now, Councillor Kent, you asked me exactly what those allowances are. The allowances are being worked on. Human resources at this moment are looking at those um, employees that are likely to be affected and where they might lose money so that they can do something with the allowances and make sure that they mitigate any loss. Now that work's still ongoing, so pro no proposals have been put to the General Services Committee or to the unions yet, but they will be put to you. They'll be put to you, not me, because you are part of the General Service Committee, not me. So you'll get sight of those then. And Councillor Kerrin, you said that we should be giving these payments with no ifs or buts, but those ifs or buts have already been agreed by the union in this collective and signed, as I said. So the way forward is to look at this and then we'll be able to have the money there to invest that extra £300,000 in the frontline workers, which is what we all want to do. But we can't invest without looking at the rest of the pay review that everybody agreed to. I can't see you, and can I ask you to uh, sum up now? I'm done. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the recommendations. <coughs> Recommendation 1.1. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendation made? In the recommendation as it is in my report? Yes, yes recommendation 1.1 1 .1 as, as in your report. That's, that's what I've agreed to, yeah. what's in the report. So it's agreed. Moving on to recommendation 1.2, I will now take a vote on the amendment proposed by Councillor John Kent for the recommendation 
please indicate by using your electronic hands. Can members clearly indicate by raising the hand whether they are voting against, voting in favour or abstaining? So, vote, so we'll start by voting against the recommendation. What? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. No, it's this, this matter makes no sense. Sorry. In, in, in. So you are voting against for the amendment. Yeah, you're now voting. You're now voting for the amendment. It's better. Just to clarify. So, so uh, all those voting against the amendment. Please raise their oh. hand. Can you all, can everyone put their hands down and we'll start again, please? Yeah. Right, just to just to clarify, we're this we're actually at the moment voting on recommendation one point two. The amended, yes. the amended motion. So those that are voting against the amendment at 1.2, please raise your hands. And now, if I could ask all those that have had their hand raised, voting against, to take the, to take their hands down, please. Right now. Right. Now, um, it's like all those that are vote, voting in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you could uh, take your hands down now, please. <coughs> All down. Right, and now anybody that wishes to abstain, could they please raise their hand? Okay, thank you for waiting. Um, I've just had the results through and the amendment was lost. So, as the amendment was lost, I'll now ask you to vote on the original recommendation. Can members clearly indicate by raising the hand whether they are voting against the original proposal? Okay, if you could take your hat, lower your hands, please. Thank 
Thank you. And those voting in favour, please raise your hands. Okay, calling it the votes, the ori original recommendation is carried. Now moving on to item 12, which is the capital strategy for 2021-22. Councillor Head, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 61 to 90. You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. This is a, the paper and it's the mechanism at which officers are provided instruction and approval to borrowing activity, including capital expenditure, capital financing and treasury management activity, namely investments from elected members. It was this paper that we took to council in 2017, in 2018 and 2019, which was voted for unanimously by full council, including the borrowing levels. In 2020, as we know, things changed. The council was no longer a united council and it's been a long time 49 members instructed officers to invest more so to reduce council tax. But when we did work together in 2018, 18 and 19, we did increase the resilience of the council. We were able to treble our reserves position to help withstand significant economic and market volatility, much like the world we've lived in for nearly 12 months. It's an approach which provided additional resources of circa £90 million to support the delivery of core services over three years whilst giving headroom for more considered reforms for services. And it's also enabled multi-year budget services, which enabled us to clean the borough up, including policing in our community, and improve our children's social care service, pioneer mental health initiatives, among others. Now, three parties won't put politics aside, and the outcomes, quite frankly, couldn't have been achieved without them doing so. It would be churlish of me not to recognise that, given that the approach was voted for initially in October 2017, when the administration party was seven short of the majority, and it required a majority council from the sovereign body of full council to put into train. And as it happened, 49 members voted on three separate occasions since 2017 to continue that approach and delegate authority to officers for borrowing levels. But the world has changed a lot in 12 months. We no longer have different parties wrestling for credit for the approach or facing demands of the spending of budget surpluses, voting for the borrowing levels, or indeed instructing officers to increase investments to reduce council tax. The market is not available as it once was, and the mood music around councils being entrepreneurial in the pursuit of self-sufficiency is no longer the same there either. Now, at the end of last year, this council announced the start of the cessation of the investment approach, which has always been a means to an end. And this paper is the formal beginning of the end. And the first part of that wind down is to cut projected borrowing approved levels substantially by 350 million as has been reported to members before, by not undertaking new investment activity, not budgeting for replacing current investment activity when bonds mature over the next seven to eight years. We will see a reduction of projected approved borrowing levels over the next several years. But that also means that interest receivable will also fall, meaning that we will not have the same income that we do now. To illustrate the pause of the approach means that the council was not taking any new investment. So we cannot receive about two million of interest that it had intended to secure this year. That is two million we cannot spend on discretionary services, nor use to give headroom for reforms to be implemented as considerately as we would have hoped. But the administration acknowledges, the corporate overview and scrutiny itself acknowledges that service reform is required and that an accelerated timetable is needed. They are correct. We had hoped for more time, but things have changed. Now, members will also recall last year that Council, all 49 of us, voted to support the formation of a constitutive arrangement to improve the level of oversight and monitoring around the Council's investment activity. A shadow board has operated since the autumn of last year, terms of reference are under development and being ready for a member's decision in May at the annual general meeting. Also, an investment statement or strategy statement is also under development, 
for publication in the early municipal year, which will be published on the council website and will provide key information around the council's commercial work in this one document, which is easy, well, we'll, sorry, will enable easy reference and reading for anyone interested. The capital strategy will continue to enable the funding of key infrastructure and regeneration capital products, an absolute must in the national and local economic recovery in a post-COVID world, and a must for those who passionately believe that far better days can still lie, and that there are even more ways to help even more people in this borough be proud to call Farrock the place where they live, work and play. The paper has passed through corporate overview and scrutiny, Mr Mayor, and the Shadow Investment Committee. And there have been no emerging recommendations contrary to what officers presented back on the 21st of January uh, through those forums. Thank you, Councillor Head. Councillor John Kent, do you wish to speak? I'll speak very briefly, Mr Mayor, to say that we will be uh, supporting this document tonight. I welcome much of what Councillor Heather said this evening. Uh, I, I think that he's right that the approach to borrowing and investment was carried out was supposed to be a means to an end. It was supposed to buy time to enable us to uh, work out a secure, sustain, sustainable, uh, medium term financial future for, for, for the council. But for too many people, it turned into the ends itself. And for too many people, it, it gave them the opportunity to play at speculating with somebody else's money. Uh, that led to us uh, borrowing, I think, too much money and taking too many risks. So, as, as Councillor Hebb says, this is the formal beginning of the end, and I welcome that. I welcome the lowering of the maximum borrowing limit by £350 million. Pounds. I welcome uh, that there will be more transparency and more oversight of investment de decisions. Uh, and I welcome the fact that we will now be concentrating our borrowing on delivering key infrastructure. So, much to welcome, uh, Mr Mayor, and we will be supporting. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? Yes, I agree with JK and agree with um, Shane. I voted for a great business model way back when. The only thing I would have said, why didn't we borrow more, which may have come back to bite me on the bottom. The only thing in that mix is Liam Kavanagh, the playboy, which nobody knew about and nobody was... We didn't know he was going to be what he was. So, but yeah, hundred percent with this, hundred percent with JK, hundred percent with Shane. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Do you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to say thank you, Shane, for your report, Councillor Hebb, um, and uh, echo the words of, of Councillor Kent. And um, going forward, I think this is this is all positive and, and good. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Would you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to say that I'm in support and uh, yes, I'm, I'm with members with this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Are there any members that wish to speak on this sub matter? <laughs> Councillor Gladhill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and it's good to see that there is, uh, again, uh, a unanimous, well, what appears to be a unanimous uh, uh, thought right across the chamber uh, in relation to uh, the change to the strategy in, um, uh, in the way that we invest. Um, whilst I'm sure uh, some of the members will disagree, indeed, as, as we've just heard from uh, the leader of the independents, he would have, he would have liked more um, uh, uh, borrowing to invest. Uh, equally, we've heard from the leader of the opposition, who thinks it was too much. Um, you know, th th these theoretical arguments could go on all night, every night, um, for, for no particular reason. We'll all agree to disagree. But what is good is that we're all agreeing to moving this forward, and that is the important thing. And as, as Brevin Barlow said right at the beginning of this meeting, um, you know, thinking outside the box, and indeed thinking outside of politics, and thinking what is the best for Thurrock as a whole. Um, and this hopefully is uh, an indicator. Um, for people to do that as we go through the evening. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hebb, do you wish to sum up? I started uh, my, my statement saying that a lot has changed in 12 months and we, we appear to have gone full circle, which is, is pleasing, and that there has been a degree of reconciliation uh, between us as a chamber about what we should do, what we can do and what the successes have been. You know, if I comment on the, the borrowing levels, you know, 
it is something that you know a number of us that we're here in 2019 well actually not a number of us all of us voted for we all voted for that uh, borrowing envelope but it's in our power to do something different with it and in, indeed we are um so you know, the reconciliation is positive i think if i look at the opportunity that we have constructed or constructing in terms of the constitutional arrangement. I think there is every reason why this council can do what it done in 17, 18 and 19, stand shoulder to shoulder. We can have our differences of opinions. Let's be honest, we're never all going to agree with one another, but there are some things where we do need to stand shoulder to shoulder on and do the right thing by the residents. So thank you very much for the commentary uh, and, and the contributions. And I have put the recommendations of note in the report, Mr Mayor, uh, to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Head. I will now proceed to the recommendations. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendations made? Mm -hmm. uh, we've got no uh, disagreements, so therefore the recommendation is carried. We now move on to item 13 of the report, which of the meeting, which is general fund budget proposals. Councillor Gled Gledhill, would you please introduce the report that can be found, found on pages 91 to 130? Councillor Gledhill, you have 20 minutes allocated for this point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this financial year has been like no other for over a century. It has put a strain on the whole world. It's put a strain on this great nation. It's put a strain on Thurrock. And it's put a strain on every single resident within. Who would have thought it that this time last year, the nation would be coming to all but a standstill, not once, but three times. Over 120,000 deaths of loved ones that weren't expected. Terms like PPE, epidemiology, um, pandemic, all becoming day-to-day -day, uh, words. Um, certainly the whole nation having to come together and look to our government for support. They in turn, of course, look to the NHS, to the care homes, the carers, and indeed to the local government to deliver the billions of pounds of support this nation needed to see us through. That's whether you were a business, whether you are a resident, or indeed helping out the council uh, with its finances, uh, the extra finances that it saw it spend. Now, from the day that the restrictions and lockdown was announced, Thurrock Council started to do all it could to help support residents. Its IT infrastructure rapidly upgraded to allow staff to work from home where possible to ensure that residents' inquiries were still dealt with. Now, whilst people may say that, the, well, so what about IT? We have still managed to maintain a very good um, uh, response time to our residents. Our residents are still contacting us uh, on a daily basis in large numbers and indeed using our website. So this is indeed um, uh, one of those things that showed we stepped forward when we needed to. We made sure that PPE, which at the time was in short supply nationally, was provided to private nursing homes, to carers and to our staff who had to visit residents in their home, own homes to look after them. Staff came together and volunteered uh, to help uh, put food parcels together, the food that we purchased, the, the food that was made up by volunteers, and then distributed to residents in the what is now an old category A, where they needed them, where they couldn't get support from their close and loved ones, where they couldn't get support from their neighbours, or where they couldn't get support from the uh, supermarkets delivering direct. Staff were working all hours every day to ensure businesses and residents got the support payments they needed as soon as humanly possible. Funding had to be found and allocated to support local bus companies to retain services. Funding to early years providers to uh, meet business adaptation costs so uh, the young could still go uh, and receive um, help, support and education. Um, Organising additional laptops and uh, ICT equipment for children to be able to uh, connect to the internet and learn from home where possible. Taking all the rough sleepers off the streets where they wish to engage with us, indeed something that we did quite well uh, in Thurrock. Even having to organise temporary mortuary facilities if the worst had happened and the facilities at the mortuaries and indeed at, um, the funeral parlours were overwhelmed, something I'm glad that we didn't have to use but had to have on standby. Now, none of this came for free. As uh, partially outlined in page 110 of the report, 
extra costs such as supplying more care for our most vulnerable adults and children who needed support, the loss of income from things like uh, street parking charges for, to theatre income, extra costs for staff for COVID compliancy uh, and increases in support for all those that were homeless. And all the examples um, listed before came to around £17 million. Now, Her Majesty's Government generously supported Thurrock Council to over £15 million during the pandemic uh, so far to help pay for lost income. However, just on this was £2 million shortfall. Plus further service pressures and reductions in investment, as we've already heard, has led to um, last year's £4 million one-off surplus being used to cover the shortfall and indeed the reduction uh, in income last year. But on the plus side, it does appear that we will not be using um, our reserves this year as, as feared um, halfway through the financial year. So now to the figures and where this year's increases will be spent. First, I'm going to go to the adult social care increase of 3%. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. As briefly um, outlined in my opening speech, and this, um, the pandemic shows a need for further investment in adult social care. I'm not going to open up the debate of whether money should um, to invest in adult social care should be raised locally or nationally. Anyone who's been in local government for more than a few years knows the government, irrespective of colour, doesn't just uh, write a cheque based out on what you spend. It has algorithms, it has formulae, it has processes. And all of these invariably mean that not quite enough money is taken from the taxpayer nationally to be given to be spent by thorough council locally on those that need it the most. This means um, we would have to raise more tax locally to cover that difference. So the obvious solution to rather go in this long convoluted way through national and local is for it just to be raised locally and spent on local residents. Adult social care is the largest budget at the council at £43 million per year and is needed to cover everything from the cost for those who need advice uh, on general day-to-day -day care uh, and information or for such services such as Meals on Wheels, all the way up to the 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week care packages and support packages, some of which cost between £200,000 and £300,000 per year each. Now, had the government not allowed local councils to raise more money for this vital service since 2016, the service would be roughly £6.5 million pounds short of the funding it currently has to spend. That is the equivalent of us having to cut 400,000 hours of home care to where they are, um, where they needed the most to get to uh, a, a position um, uh, to where we would have been without this uh, extra spending uh, power. So since 2016, this council has had to raise the equivalent of around 10% in council tax to improve the vision to our most vulnerable adults. Now, I'm sure that most members will agree that that is a good use of, of, of money that is raised locally. Now, this year, we're going to have to ask uh, again for an increase, and that, and that will raise roughly £2 million um, locally to be spent solely on the adult social care budget. Now, this money raised will go to the following areas. £504,000 to cover inflation and general demographic growth. That is where um, people are moving into the borough with extra care needs. Uh, something that uh, has always been uh, an issue for all local authorities, but certainly for Thurrock. Uh, £610,000 uh, uplift for care home rates, £980,000 uh, worth of uplift for residential nursing and dementia home rates, and over £400,000, uh, uh, again, for increase for payments through transitions from uh, adult social care, from children's social care, and indeed other routes into this vital service. Now these uplifts, as mentioned uh, earlier, will uh, allow providers to be competitive, to increase the salary to the staff that are supplying the fantastic care to our residents, and to ensure that they are adequately, adequately provided with PPE for their safety and indeed the safety of their residents. Now anyone adding this up as we go along sees as equals roughly 2.5 million pound already, which is more than we will raise with this social care precepts. So the difference of this is coming from um, a little bit more from the social care grant, uh, from the general fund increase, which I'll cover much later, and indeed the vacant post savings, which again, I will cover later. You can see this is not frivolous, uh, frivolous sorry, spending on management or any other negatives th normally thrown at any council by any opposition seeking headlines or to oppose for opposition's sake. 
This is the money for day-to-day -day vital needs to increase the salary of those supporting our most vulnerable, for the cost increase uh, for the services, and for those who are moving from children's uh, to adult social care, and as I said, to ensure that uh, sufficient PPE is available to protect both staff and residents. Now, before I move on to the 1.99 general fund increase, uh, we've just uh, heard um, that the investments we're undertaking um, will be decreasing. So equally, we'll see a decrease in the amount of money we generate ourselves to fund services over and above statute levels. And I am glad that that was supported uh, this year again. Uh, and hopefully as we move through, we can uh, improve on our um, investments and start to increase the income from them without increasing the uh, borrowing as outlined earlier by the Leader of the Opposition. So we're going to move to the reserves. Um, we currently have a number of reserves built up over the time of the administration. These are £11 million in general fund reserves. The report makes clear that these reserves are still required at this level. This money is here to support the budget in the event of something like a major care provider going bust, or us having to support those residents if we have significant flooding and need to rehome whole streets of residents. Now, I could obviously continue with examples, but I won't, because I'm sure we will get the point. And frankly, I will not gamble on something catastrophic like I've just mentioned happening and then not be the level of reserves needed to support residents at that crucial time. We have one and a half million pounds of reserves for social care to help manage in-year pressures. Again, I will not gamble on there not being enough uh, money um, in this budget um, when it's a demand-led budget. And as members are fully aware, year on year, there are always pressures. We have a £6 million financial resilience reserve for the loss of income or for any other pressure from uh, loss of treasury. But whilst we have invested wisely, so wisely in fact that we receive over £30 million a year from them at the moment, the risk of shortfall in income from any of our many sources is not one that can remain uninsured by again spending this reserve, so it should remain as it is. And finally, we have a £5.5 million budget management reserve and it is this reserve and only this reserve that we will be tapping into this year to help set the balanced budget. Excuse me, Mr Mayor. This year's increase will raise a general fund income by about £1.3 million from residents. And this is going to be matched by £3.3 million from the reserve, as mentioned. So for every £1 of uh, residents pay for the general fund increase, the council matches nearly three times that in reserves. These reserves have only been um, able to be raised as our investment programme and, and these are the same investment programmes that supported our, our services for the past couple of years and indeed hopefully uh, as we go through and we reduce uh, the cost of the council uh, that those investments again can turn back into uh, one-off services to be spent uh, as and when we need on priorities uh, as they appear. Now I'm sure the question on everyone's lips is well, why don't we do more? Why don't you spend more on your reserves? The money's just sitting there. Well, I'd like to give you a simple answer, but it just isn't that easy. I've already outlined um, what the uh, um, uh, reserve budgets are for. Um, and as I outlined in my speech, last year, due to COVID, we saw more expenditure than the generous grant from the government to the tune of about four, four million pounds that we um, spent that uh, wasn't uh, backed by a government uh, grant. This year, we will allocate an extra 10% to the local council tax scheme. But what if this isn't enough? We've had to allocate £2.7 million for the shortfalls on council tax and business rates income. Yes, we may well recover that money in years to come, but that money is um, the cash flow that the council uses day by day. But instead of trying to squeeze uh, this from those who truly cannot pay at the moment, we're subbing it from the reserves. But again, what if that isn't enough? What if we don't see our other income increase to pre-COVID or even better than pre-COVID levels? What if we don't see um, a back to normal uh, income from trade refuse or from parking income or from theatre income or indeed Grangewater's income, for example? All of these, um, it would be prudent to ensure that we have some money left in those reserves to um, cover the shortfall as we go through the year. Of course, if government is quite willing to uh, grant more money to local authorities, indeed, uh, back up the, the vast amounts of money it's given uh, uh, thorough to distribute either direct to residents, businesses, or obviously to allocate for the extra work, we will obviously take that with open hands. But on top of that, we've also got a million set aside for the local plan to ensure that residents will have their say in shaping the borough's future. Again, a pressure on the reserves. 
excuse me. Uh, so we need to make sure that um, as we go through this uh, uh, this year's budget, we have the headroom to cover unexpected, the unexpected. This is clearly laid out in the report of the Section 151 officer uh, in his Section 25 appendix. Now, as we know, Councillor Head constantly refers to our reserves as our rainy day fund. But you know what? It isn't all about that rainy day. It's for the days that come after where the unexpected expense after expense comes in. On top of that, we also need to keep our reserves at a minimum just in case there are further rainy days. As such, the use of reserves would put us and residents at risk. And frankly, Mr Mayor, that would not be prudent or indeed something any member should be considering. Equally, I will not expose this council to having to submit a Section 114 notice, the council equivalent of being in financial administration before going bust, as we saw in Croydon uh, this year. I will not support using 50% or more of our reserves in the hope that nothing else goes wrong and kick the can down the road. Remember, every pound of reserves that's used today from day-to-day -day running of the council will need to be found next year and every subsequent year. So when the reserves run out, it would mean more cuts, more rises, and indeed, um, just to make ends meet, as well as having that uh, safety net completely removed on a financial front. So to help further and not to dip into those vital reserves, further, further, uh, reserves further, the council is also not looking to fill four million pound of current staff vacancies it's carrying. So just for clarity, that is four million pound of jobs that are not currently filled and any new vacancies that come up throughout the year will be closely scrutinised before they are replaced, irrespective of the position of the council, which I'm sure will please the leader of the independent group. So it's for the details. The 1.99% council tax increase will raise roughly £1.3 million and is the equivalent of 40 pence per household per week for about 70% of our residents. It will be allocated to £700,000 worth of council tax support for those who may need it as we move along the roadmap out of lockdown and more residents find that they will need this support as they may have lost their jobs, that furlough has come to an end and they're um, put on shorter time or indeed their companies cannot um, move them to back onto a full-time position. £300,000 for our lowest paid staff to receive the government cost of living grant, £250 uh, for the coming year. Indeed, I was going to raise that earlier um, uh, with, the council, uh, sorry, with the leader of the um, independent group. The £250 was that suggested and indeed put forward by government, nowhere else. £500,000 to further support vulnerable adults above and beyond the 3% adult social care precepts. Now, again, anyone with a calculator will see this is still more than the £1.3 million raised by the council tax increase to residents. It does mean that the remainder will come out of the reserves, as mentioned, out of the banking post uh, um, savings, as mentioned, and indeed all the other £7 million pressures on our vital services will come from that funding. Now, briefly to the capital budget. As outlined in the report, it's good practice to outline the capital programme. To be clear, the capital budget is not the money used for day-to-day -day services, such as social care, bin collections, etc. This is money used from the sale of property we no longer need, from prudential borrowing or from services. It's worth remembering that even though this is one of the most difficult years for local government, Thurrock is still investing money to improve the borough. Some of these projects have already started. Some, where money has been spent in advance of implementation, are going forward and others are still being worked up. So when the plans are submitted to government for extra support, it is done so with a true costing and not something drawn up from a guesstimate of 10 years previous as we've seen uh, over the years. A good example of a capital budget is the road resurfacing I mentioned in my speech at the opening of this meeting, Mr Mayor. 90 kilometres of road, uh, resurfaced road a metre wide delivered in 2020, a straight road from Grays all the way to Brighton Pier. But I need to be clear that, as explained at the scrutiny meetings, to drive down prudential borrowing and the cost to residents, as well as to ensure that staff who are working hard in the relevant teams are able to cope with the number of capital projects, the number of these projects is being reduced. But I can assure residents um, such programmes as the new medical centres uh, across the borough, something that we have been uh, pushing for and indeed have started to de deliver for many years. The Grays Regeneration Projects, um, which again was on the cards for many years, but we're now starting to deliver there. School improvements, as we saw in Perfleet, will continue. Council state renewal uh, as part of the HRA programme and indeed the uh, improvement programme for homes will continue. East facing slips, for example, at Lakeside will also continue in their planning uh, phases. So in conclusion, 
These rises proposed are, as explained, to help support our most vulnerable adults to ensure that there's adequate supply of PPE uh, for those working um, directly with people in care, to increase the income of those on lower wages, either at our care providers or at the council, and for a 10% increase in council tax support provision for those who may need it next year um, as furlough comes to an end and we hopefully try to get back to normal. All at the same time, we've had to maintain sufficient reserves should we need them in the future. We have re reduced the number of capital projects to reduce the pressure on the budget, but at the same time have not stopped investing in improving the borough. And again, I will mention, and before my voice fails completely, that we are holding these four million pounds worth of vacant, space, uh, uh, vacant uh, positions open. We are not, uh, uh, not recruiting to um, directors who are uh, leaving the uh, borough after a long service uh, with us uh, and that all reorganisation has already gone to general services committee so irrespective of where it is in the um, local authority we will look at all jobs and those are not needed will be gone now as I say my voice is failing Mr Mayor and I'm running out of time so with that I submit our budget to the chamber thank you uh, Councillor Gretel Councillor John Kent you have 15 minutes to reply to the leader's speech. Thank, thank you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, and I, I thank the leader for, for his words. <clears throat> and it's only right that we start by talking about COVID and the impact of COVID, which has ravaged Thurrock just as it has the rest of the country. So we now know that as of last week, we'd had 434 residents that have died uh, with COVID. 434 is just a number, but behind each of those was, was a person. There was a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a son, a daughter. There were people with friends, they, they were neighbours. And there are families across Thurrock, as there are across the country, where there is one more empty chair around the dinner table uh, than there was this time last year. And inevitably, when it comes to a budget setting council meeting, we concentrate on the financial impacts of, of COVID and we, we have to balance the books. But we must never forget that the human impact of COVID is much, much more important than any financial uh, impact. You know, when the pandemic first hit the country last year, there was an incredible kind, kind of coming together of people within the community to do the right thing uh, and to do their bit. There was a real spirit of solidarity as people came together to support those who were unable to support themselves at that time, whether it's because they were shielding, uh, because they were vulnerable in some way, because they had children or dependents that were shielding. We, we had people both formally and informally shopping and delivering food. Uh, I see Councillor Smith on my screen. I know that she was one of those that, that was out there doing it. We had people collecting and delivering medicines. We had people ensuring that the elderly and vulnerable had a hot meal that people who had previously been street homeless had somewhere to sleep and a hot meal. We had people that were doing the things that you don't, you, you, you just don't imagine, like making sure that neighbours, neighbours and strangers' dogs were walked and properly exercised. More recently, we've had people fundraising and buying laptops so that kids can home school as effectively as possible. We've had people getting out there purchasing uh, the wireless routers with SIM cards so that people can actually have some Wi-Fi uh, rather than just relying on the allowance that comes with mum or dad's phone. That spirit of solidarity that's been shown not only across Thurrock but across the country is genuinely uh, the best the best of Britain. It's the best of Thurrock and we should do all we can to harness it so that as we come out of the pandemic we can get the thorough that we all all want to see. But Mr Mayor, as we came through the pandemic, it did expose some of the weaknesses that 10 years of austerity has left. 
we did see some of the weaknesses in our care system. We did see some of the weaknesses in the NHS. And it took us a long time to get through it. And, and yes, we saw some of the damage that had been done to local authorities by 10 years of cuts. Now, this authority lost £50 million in grant funding over the last 10 years. And that's the backdrop, Mr Mayor, against which we come to the budget setting uh, this, this year. Now, I'll start with those things that I really welcome in this budget. It's sensible to look at vacant posts and not to fill those vacant posts. It's sensible uh, to use capital receipts where we can to lever in uh, the, the gearing for, 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 for some revenue money. And it's sensible uh, to have an appropriate use of reserves. That is what reserves are there for. And I agree with Councillor Gledhill on the importance of reserves. You know, I remember the day that I became leader of the council here, our reserves were down at two million pounds. The day that we left, reserves were up at eight million pounds and we'd recently taken seven million for reserves to buy our way out of the Serco contract. Uh, the one thing that released more opportunities for savings uh, than, than, than anything else. So I welcome uh, all of those acts. But you know, as Councillor Bledhill has said, you can only use the same reserves once. You can only use those capital receipts once. So there is a danger that we're kicking the can down the road and just leaving a bigger problem in future years and we have to make sure that's not what we do. There's a danger in vacant posts. If those posts aren't filled, then there is important work that's not being done, that's not being carried out. And as we look at the budget, we see a capital programme uh, that is really pretty thin. And one of the reasons that that capital programme is thinner than we might like is that because of those staff vacancies, we're not carrying the expertise that we need to deliver a bigger and more complicated capital programme. So there are dangers. We've identified uh, for this year 19 million pounds of tax rises, of grants and of one-offs to make sure that we can balance the budget. That still leaves over £25 million to be found over the next couple of years in order to deliver balanced budgets in the medium term. And this budget really should have been the, the chance, the opportunity to start looking ahead at how we're going to balance the books in the medium term. And I really think it's a missed opportunity this evening uh, to actually start that process. I have to say this is the thinnest budget that I've known in my time on the council. The actual budget papers themselves run to no more than 17 pages. And there is very little, uh, very little detail in here. So as we look forward over the medium term financial forecast, we can see that there are something in the region of five million pounds worth of savings that appear to already have been identified for that period between 2022 and 2024. Other than the move to fortnightly bin collections, I have no idea what any of those identified savings are. And I would be grateful if Councillor Gledhill could run through some of them when he responds. Mr Mayor, there are things that I would hope we could all agree on uh, that would help us to balance the budget in the medium term. We've already discussed uh, high paid staff this evening. And I really do feel that moving from five officers paid over £100,000 a year to 18, an increase of 260% in just a couple of years, is too much. I would hope we all agree that we need to do something about that. I think the agency staff costs for this council, which are currently running at over £7 million a year, are too high. I would hope that we all agree that's too high and would want to bring it down. Mr Mayor, I think the layers of management that seem to have uh, sprung up over the last few years uh, are just bizarre. The bureaucracy seems to be running away with this. And I'll give an example. Uh, I asked for the, the uh, staffing maps, the, the senior management team maps, just for the environment. Uh, I know that it's difficult to get a like-for-like -like comparison, so I asked for that to be restricted to like-for-like -like environment as it would have been in 2016. So in 2016, there was a head of service 
two frontline service managers and one strategy projects and operations manager. So four senior members of staff there and environment. Now there's a director and assistant director, three strategic leads and three operation managers. The bureaucracy, uh, the, the senior management has doubled. You know, no wonder we've seen such a big increase in high paid officers. We have to wonder if that's, uh, if that's really necessary. Uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, Mr Mayor, that it isn't. But there is no way that we are merely going to make savings and cut away out of the problems of the next couple of financial problems for the next couple of years. We need to do two other things. I think that we need to look again at how we trade our services. In the past, we've done some really good work uh, with shared legal services and trading legal services, with shared planning services and, and trading planning services. We need to do much, much more of that. Uh, we're currently doing some really good work with, with the fraud team and trading that service. We need to do more. But I come back to that, uh, that spirit of solidarity that we saw at the start of the pandemic and we've seen all the way through the pandemic. People in Thurrock are entrepreneurial, they're caring, they're full of dynamism. We need to be harnessing that dynamism. We need to be har harnessing that spirit of solidarity to, to give people the tools to do some of those things uh, that we currently do that the community could do better. There are great examples across the borough of where community groups and community uh, companies uh, deliver services. Hardy Park in Stamford, a really good example, delivering good quality services over there at almost zero cost to the council. There are good models out there and we should be looking at how we, uh, how, how we kind of uh, roll, roll those out much, much more widely. Mr Mayor, I've gone over some of those things uh, that, that I will support, but I have to turn to some of those things now that we can't support. We can't support those unspecified cuts to terms and conditions uh, which could cut frontline workers' pay by, by thousands of pounds. And we can't at this time uh, support a 5% increase in council tax. Now, I want to be fair, it would be churlish not to say that we all welcome some of the government interventions that have helped us through the pandemic. We welcome furlough. We welcome the business rate suspension. We welcome the £20 uplift in universal credit, all of which uh, must be extended in next week's budget to prevent further damage to the economy. But frankly, we in local government have been failed by the Conservative government. They said they would do whatever it takes to support local government through the pandemic, but they've let us down with limited help and a frankly paltry settlement. They announced before Christmas a 4.5% increase in local government spending power. However, when you examine it, three quarters of that increase in spending power is predicated on a 5% council tax hike. That's not fair on people in Thurrock. The government encouraged us to go out and spend. They encouraged us to do whatever ever it takes, and they promised to recompense us for that, and they have reneged on their side of the deal. Mr Mayor, we know that unemployment in Thurrock now stands at 7%, which is well above the national average. Youth unemployment in Thurrock is now at 11%, again, well above the national average. And we know that it's only going to get tougher. We know that growing numbers of local families are struggling to get by, and more will struggle as we emerge from this pandemic. Mr Mayor, the last thing they need is another council tax increase. We will therefore be voting against that aspect of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Clance, Councillor Gledo, you have 10 minutes to respond to Councillor John Kent. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Kent, for, for your words, especially those um, where we're in agreement. Um, you know, we, we quite often um, uh, in local politics spar over um, you know, the words on the, on the head of a pin and, and, and everything else. But on the whole, there are a, a number of things that we can agree with. And you're absolutely right. You know, there has been a financial uh, impact for um, uh, COVID, um, but it really has impacted us all. I now know a lot more of my neighbours um, and thank them for the support uh, they gave me when I needed it. 
Um, we've all known uh, people and lost people. Um, they, they may not be family members, but they'll be close friends um, or, or friends of friends or indeed people that we've interacted with as elected members for years that are suddenly um, no longer with us. And you know, not only are they no longer with us, they're no longer with their families. And it is, um, I say, probably the most difficult time for local government, but probably even more so for all of our residents. Now I'm going to touch on a few of the points that he has raised in disagreement. So, for instance, with the vacant posts, um, we can't have it all. We can't have um, uh, another uh, four million pounds worth of, of staff doing work when we don't have uh, the resources uh, for them to uh, start to uh, deliver um, uh, the programme, sorry, the uh, capital programme uh, that we had before. Um, we do need to be really quite clear that you know um, there is um, because of the uh, reduction in the amount of income we get from um, our investments and because of other reasons um, that we do need to fill that gap. And you're quite right, we cannot kick the can down the road into next year and next year and the following year by keep on tapping into the reserves. So uh, we do, do need to all pull together. And indeed, um, I, I just verified with um, uh, one of my shares of scrutiny. Uh, and said, I, I'm sure that all of those uh, savings that we've um, proposed and been put forward actually have gone for overview scrutiny, and uh, he confirmed that they have. So I, I'm going to leave that one there. Now, now you when you mentioned um, uh, the management and the environment team, it did actually make me uh, smile a little bit. Yes, you're probably right. In 2015, um, there probably was only four uh, managers there uh, uh, to, to, to manage um, the whole of that department. But let's face it. You left us no department. You left us no grass cutting equipment. You left us no street cleaners. You left, you left us pretty much nothing. The only thing you didn't leave us was a nice little note saying there's no money, there's no team, there's no environment services. Now we're going to move on to the fact that you cannot support this £870,000 um, uh, terms and conditions change. Now, as outlined by Councillor Hoodin earlier in a report, um, this particular amount was agreed to be um, discussed and worked with by all of the unions. It is now only one union that is looking to uh, take action in relation to that. Now, quite frankly, we cannot have a situation where our uh, management team enter into negotiations with unions only for them to renege on that at, at the first opportunity. Yes, these members of staff have been at the front end of um, uh, the pandemic on, on the whole. They've done a, an absolutely fantastic job they got hit with um, COVID no, no more, no less than, than any other residents, but they were out there every day collecting the bins that they could when they could. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that they're exempt from having to uh, play their part or indeed get rid of outdated practices um, that we understand are still um, um, being used as part of their terms and conditions. I'm not going to go into those terms and practices. I'm not going to um, undershoot our um, officers who are negotiating with the said unions. Uh, now, when it comes to the settlement nationally, I, I, again, I find it a little bit ironic that um, the National Labour Party, the Lib Dems, and indeed all the other parties, fail to say that there was a problem with the local government settlement. So one can only assume that you know silence is agreement in that. And if it's not an agreement, why didn't they... Um, put forward um, um, their voices and say, no, this wasn't enough. Um, so we can assume that if the National Party um, uh, agreed with it, then one would assume all the local parties agree with it. I cannot remember a year where central government um, has given everything that local government want, unless it was the back end of the um, uh, brown years, where money was thrown everywhere to try and keep um, voters on board. That failed. Because that money is taxpayers' money. So you can only get taxpayers' money from people that are being taxed, that are employed. So that's why our government has put so much money, not only towards the council, to try and ensure that our extra spend has been covered. It hasn't covered it all, but it's covered the vast majority of it. And indeed, some of the things that we did were over and above what government would have expected us to do. But I'm sorry, was the level of expectation I expected our officers and council uh, to do. Indeed, this was appreciated by those that received that extra support and care. So I would have thought that, you know, again, um, the, the Labour Party locally would, would have realised that the last thing that the um, increased number of um, unemployed residents, whether they be um, youth unemployment or adult unemployment that we've seen due to the uh, pandemic, 
The last thing that they would want to hear is that Labour are not supporting £700,000 extra council tax support um, in this budget. And indeed, they're not supporting um, that aspect of the budget at all. But do we see any alternatives? Do we hear where this um, money would come from? No, we don't. We hear opposition for opposition's sake. Now, I can see a number of my members have already got their hands up, and I'm sure a good number more will do so as well. And quite frankly, opposition for opposition's sake, when you're going to effectively vote against £700,000 to those that are going to need it the most in the coming year, for those uh, two million pounds or two and a half million pounds to vulnerable adults who are going to need it most next year, then I'm sorry that will sit on your shoulders and you can explain to uh, those residents who don't get the support for, for those who find out that they're you know uh, that the council is going to be delayed in paying them support for their council tax and other support that rests on your shoulders and every single member here who votes this budget down. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Councillor Byrne, do you wish to speak? Oh, yes, please. I am, can never be found guilty of opposition for opposition's sake. So, first of all, I'd like to just clarify something. The Mayor totally confused me. So I voted against pay rises for the lower paid workers, but I would have voted for pay increases for lower paid workers. But the way he put it, Everybody was confused. Next question, who decides what jobs are not needed? The next thing, union talks. If we are talking unions and we are going into discussions with unions, can I ask why the CEO sent individual letters to each individual union member and bypass the union talks? That is, yeah, you're not talking to the unions. For me, JK is a wordsmith and delivers great words. I'll put it as I see it, and my thoughts. So my thoughts on the budget are, I've had a number of, I know I've had a number of your lot asking, what's your alternative budget, Gary? And they will laugh out loud. I say that's not until next March when I get a say in the budget. In reality, it's a waste of time. For as long as your lot sit with your sole majority, your budget will be voted through irrespective of what is said tonight. So instead, I looked at your budget. Are you really out of touch with, with actually what is happening out there? Business is in trouble. Thousands of Thorrick residents can't pay the rates bill they have now. Now they face a 5% increase that just adds to the misery. We have residents who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Residents at home with wearing coats, hats, scarves because they, don't cons they now consider eating as a luxury item. Call the council if you're in trouble, I hear you say. They will listen. I say empty words. They do give great advice. They give advice on how to screw your landlord for rent money so you have enough money at the end of the month to pay your borough, borough council tax in full. They don't tell you things like discretionary housing benefit. Citizens' advice do that for you. We are actually advising on how to build up a debt mountain, a debt mountain, not only for you, but also for your landlord. Your budget is just adding fuel to this fire. So how do we not sting the residents more than we have to? Let's start at the start of the food chain. All on full pay, saving thousands or saving lots of money on travel costs. So then furlough and job losses are just something they hear on the news. We have assistant directors who have senior managers to assist them so the assistant directors can assist the directors on 150k a year who can't do the job without an assistant director. We have 11 senior pay bands. Do we have too many layers of management? Are there six-figure six savings to be made? How many departments have more managers now than they did three or four years ago is another question that needs to be asked. Look deeply into the value, look deeply into the value for money. In business, I always looked at profit per pound of labor. We have to do something along those lines. I don't see any outside-the-box thinking, as Councillor Hewling said. You can put hundreds of extra hours into this building for free with cost savings. Councillor Byrne, can you start to sum up, please? You... Okay. Our workers would embrace it and unions would argue against it, wouldn't argue against it. That's where we need to be. You should be presenting a more commercially budget. 
before you continue mugging, mugging our residents, I'll say look around and get your own house in order. We have to be through right, to and not take the easy option. Councillor Byrne. Councillor Byrne. One question, please explain why it's a 4.9 increase and not a 5% increase. On a personal level, That's it, that, uh, thank, you. Side, thank, up, thank you, Councillor Byrne. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Byrne. Moving on to Councillor Massey, do you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll keep it really brief as I know lots of members want to speak on this. Um, let me start by saying I'm really pleased that we've had one of the lowest, if not the lowest, council tax amounts in Essex. This is a top of a table that Farrock should be very pleased with historically. Uh, what is not so pleasing is the low placement of Farrock in the Ministry of Housing and Communities the Local Government 2019 data, which shows Farrock amongst the bottom five based on deprivation data in Essex. So I asked, is there a very good reason our council tax has been so low? And does it protect those who are on very low incomes and really struggling, especially at the moment? Overall, I will support the increase in the adult social care. At this time, aspects around mental health and care available in the community funds are going to be needed more than ever <coughs> coming out of this pandemic. While I cannot support the general funds at this time, so many low income residents are facing uncertain times, um, are really struggling to keep out of debt and to put food on the table and keep up with their commitments while cutting back wherever they can. I don't have all of the answers. I think this is a really hard budget to deliver, and thank you for um, delivering it. And I'll let other members take some time to make some progress. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Councillor Allen, do you wish to speak? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, again, I echo uh, a little bit what uh, Councillor Massey says, really. I mean, an increase in taxation uh, hits real hard uh, uh, in these current times. And it hits hard a large population of Farrock families. And I need to make it clear, Mr Mayor, that I uh, morally support the 3% social care aspect of the rise, uh, as I do know that the cost of social care has spiralled of late and, and those costs need to be met. However, I do not support. So therefore, I am against the one99 general funds aspects of the rise in council tax and I believe that it's not acceptable uh, with the current uh, difficulties that for residents are experiencing due to the enormous impact that this pandemic has had on already struggling families who are finding it increasingly harder to make ends meet uh, and again not knowing some not knowing where their next meal is coming from so this this increase is going to put uh, immense pressure on a lot of families so uh, although i i go with the the three percent for uh, you know our vulnerable people because they need looking after i'm 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 sadly going to be you know uh, voting against the the 1.99 percent for the general funds so uh, thank you for uh, let me speak mr mayor thank you thank you councillor Allen. would any any member like to speak on this report councillor howden thank you very much mr mayor <coughs> mr mayor i've never known across 11 budgets in which I've been in the chamber, the Labour group to be so vicious, mean-spirited and frankly dangerous. We've heard arguments for why the council tax increase needs to be voted down. Apparently 99 pence per week for the average household, more less than the cost of a loaf of bread, is the biggest issue in town. No, let me tell you what the biggest issue in town is. We have got a care market that has been ravaged by a once in a hundred year global pandemic. Care staff stressed beyond words. People being made more vulnerable. A care system that has been forced to the edge by the type of event that entire governments around the world have struggled to deal with. And that's why I put a budget forward this evening that increases how much we're investing in home care, how much we're investing in domiciliary care, in care homes, how much we're investing in foster care. All of those vulnerable areas all of those vital key workers supporting our most at-risk people we are investing in. 
it is nasty and churlish that you think politicking over 99 pence a week is worth scrapping all of this. And can I just say respectfully to Councillor Massey and Councillor Allen, voting for the precept is voting for adult social care. That does not cover child social care. That is why we have a general tax increase as well, because we need both elements to keep the care market going, to maintain the investments that we're putting in place. But some people have said we can do this through reserves. We are permanently increasing what we're paying to vital care workers. We are permanently increasing the base budget in social care to reflect the fact that more people are coming into care. We can't fund that through one-off reserves. It is a permanent budget. And that is why taxes, yes, 99 pence, do need to go up, still maintaining us the lowest council tax in Essex. And it's, it's a bit shameful. We've seen the graphics from the Labour Party on Twitter. You're actively saying to people, vote Labour and we will freeze your tax. Does that really make you proud that you're begging for votes off of the back of denying millions of pounds extra to those vulnerable people in care, those people delivering care to the vulnerable? Are you honestly proud of choking off millions of pounds of investment for those people? Frankly, the, the Labour group should be utterly ashamed of themselves. Thank you, Councillor Horton. Councillor Spillman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I just, as a point of clarification, can I, can I just, because I'm in a little bit of shock here, can I ask the Leader of the Opposition whether, just to clarify, whether he's voting against a 3% council tax increase towards the cost of adult social care? I just could, if he could clarify that before I, I make a point, because I'm, I'm just, I'm mystified. Sorry, I... I prefer you just to go on and make your point, but it's not really a period to be asking uh, other members questions. So if you carry on with your uh, your uh, question, uh, Councillor Phil. Well, I I'm going to make the assumption that the Labour group are doing this. I mean, they really have hung the vulnerable, the needy, out to dry with this decision. They really did become the nasty party of Burrock, uh, with with the way that they have, they're behaving this evening. I mean, I, I am not a, a supporter of generally of council tax increases. My preference previously was to uh, have an aggressive investment strategy rather than increasing council tax. But such a, such a strategy would not be sensible in the middle of a global pandemic. So it, it comes upon any, anyone who is not willing to be utterly reckless with the finances of this council and utterly reckless with the with the most vulnerable people in this in this borough has to vote for these increases. Yeah. We've had a catastrophic decrease in revenue due to a once in a hundred years event. We've had huge increased costs across the board responding to that. And yet the Labour group are trying to take advantage of that situation for a cheap headline now i know you're desperate yeah i know that you're worried about the national situation and you, you know the support that your your new leadership is floundering and you need an angle i've been in opposition i realize the importance of sometimes needing a hook but this really is the most disgraceful place to do it and the really sad thing is you don't even believe in what you're doing because there's absolutely no plan you know, alternative budget that you're putting forward because you can't put one together because you don't believe in it because really every Labour member should understand why we're doing this and I think there must be a huge amount of unease in the group at the instructions that are being passed down to them and if you're being whipped I really do encourage you to break that whip and do the right thing for the most vulnerable people in Thurrock. Thank you, Councillor Spillman. Councillor Mays. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to point out how tonight's shown the politics of opposition in full flow. You've had the love-in with uh, the leader of the, op uh, leader of the opposition and the leader of the independents. Uh, I think it's quite embarrassing that they don't put residents first because they claim to, but the reality of rejecting the... Uh, adult social care precepts or the rise that will affect the children's care, social care as well is just simply immoral. So 
rejecting things for the sake of rejecting things is, is just not right. Uh, it's not necessary to protect our residents. And again, it just seems to be trying to buy votes, which is just not acceptable. Uh, this is why I joined the Conservatives. They are actually doing grown up politics that are looking for the future of Thorough, not just for the votes of tomorrow or May, if you be precise. So with that in mind, I asked the opposition groups to actually put forward a credible uh, alternative budget, not just, no, we don't want a rise or we're going to freeze it in the years to come. Because as JK has said, the years to come will be difficult. We're not out of the pandemic yet. Simply saying we'll use reserves or we'll uh, freeze council tax now is just not looking ahead to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd like to start just by saying to Councillor Burns' talk that we're um, out of touch, that since 1993, we've no longer had rates. It's called council tax. However, I, I, the Labour leader mentioned the human impact of COVID was just as important as the finances. And I totally agree with him on that. But as we finally have a roadmap to leave what is certainly the worst pandemic I and probably most people in Tharrock have ever had to endure, I'm hearing opposition members looking to act in the most irresponsible way by depriving vulnerable people who need adult social care the ability to receive a good, strong service, and by leaving residents without the confidence that the core services that they depend on on a daily basis <clears throat> can continue in a fit-for-purpose manner. Reserves, they must only be used in a responsible manner, especially as we aggress a pandemic. I mean, we've all seen how reckless Labour-run councils can end up with Croydon being a prime example. And indeed, the last Labour-run administration here in Thurrock actually received cash from the Conservative-led government towards council tax, and yet still managed to decimate the environment and cut in services and leave a gaping hole for this administration to fill. So I, I'd ask, please cease your electioneering here in the chamber, as the people of Thurrock can see right through that, I assure you of that. This budget is the best and fairest way to protect our services, protect our finances, and to ensure people who need care, and indeed people who provide care, can continue to do so. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Man Manning. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think the first comment I'd like to make, Mr Mayor, I, I, you know, I just have to come back to the comments made by Councillor Ken. Um, in respect of the government shirking its responsibilities. I think regardless of your political persuasion or your views on the Prime Minister, I genuinely fail to see how anyone could deny that the measures in introduced by this government have been anything but generous. In fact, they're amongst the most generous in the world. And the reality is those vulnerable people we're talking about tonight would be threefold if it wasn't for the measures that the government has introduced to cushion the devastating blow of COVID. But we've dwelt far too much on how we're asking the vulnerable to pay more. The reality is we're not. If, if we look at unemployment, it stands at about 5.1% at the moment. But if we, even if we go back to those dark days of Labour's chronic recession, um, from 2007. Unemployment never really got above 8.5%. Now, even if we match that, the reality is that well over 90% of people aren't going to be unemployed. They might feel the pinch, but the vast majority of people will be in employment, like most of us. Thankfully, we, by the grace of God, we haven't been touched by COVID. It's those we're asking to pay a bit more for the very vulnerable people you're talking about when people need housing support, where do they come? They come to the council. When they need intervention by social services, where do they come? They come to us. How do we expect those services to be properly funded for those very people who are going to need our help if we don't put money into those services? So, you know, I have to say this, this is not about asking that small minority of people who are going to be unemployed to pay more council tax. It's asking the rest of us to do the right thing to support those people when they need it. And finally, Mr Mayor, let's just look at the members' questions which have been submitted tonight. Calls for an HGV scheme in, in West Thurrock. 
the portfolio holder for housing being asked when the council will install security gates, uh, calls for more equipment in our parks, the resumption of the brown bin service. All those things the Labour members are calling for, but they don't know, they're not proposing how they should be paid for. If you want these kind of things, they have to be paid for. And it is ridiculous that you can come to a meeting once again and offer nothing, talk down a budget and then say, oh, by the way, we want this, this, this and this. This is a sensible budget in difficult times. And I would certainly call on all members to support it. And as a final point, Mr Mayor, all we ever hear from Councillor Byrne is what he's against. Perhaps one day he will tell us what he's actually for. Thank you. Councillor Kieran. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, if this uh, budget, if this uh, tax increase goes through tonight, that means that since 2016 we will have seen council tax rise by 21%. That's the headline figure, but underneath that are a series of other charges and raises that are afflicting people. First, obviously council rents are going up, and then when you consider people who represent wards with lots of communal flats and high rises, we're seeing rises in lift maintenance, door entry, communal electricity, caretaking, additional uh, parking permits, Across Thurrock, people are on furlough. People, there are people who haven't received the support they need to self-isolate. There is uncertainty about what awaits workers in the post-COVID workplace. So this tax rise is the last thing that the people of Thurrock need. Thurrock Tories have raised council tax continually. This is a habit acquired well before COVID hit. Thurrock residents have paid enough. So I will not be voting to increase it any further. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, I support this budget that has been proposed this evening and will be agreeing to it. We all understand the difficulties people up and down the country are facing. I, I very much am as well at the moment with my own uh, family issues. Um, and the government has responded in kind to help those um, up and down the country as well. But members that are voting against this this evening are voting against helping the most vulnerable and those that need the support right now. As has already been outlined by the leader's statement, we are giving 300,000 to the lowest paid staff, or 500,000 for the continued support of the adult and children's care department outside of the precept, and a further 700,000 being put into our local council tax support, which is helping those who need to come into the council and helping those affected during this time. I'm also saddened, Mr Mayor, to see that there's no alternative budget put forward. We're hearing statements this evening about freezing and doing this and doing that. Um, and I will be touching on some points later about spending, etc. Um, but we don't see any action. And it, it seems to be a, a cause of tonight. It's a lot of statements. It's a lot of noise. But where's, where's the action? You all, as opposition members, have the ability to put forward um, alternative budgets. That is in your power to do so. But where are they? It's all well and good making a statement and posting something on Twitter, hoping it's going to get you votes while you're Mr Starmer's sinking the Labour Party, just as Corbyn did. But where's the action? You guys want to be running this council one day. You've got to be coming up with the policies which you're taking to the voters to say what you're going to do and what you're going to theoretically cut as part of your um, savings you're wishing to make this evening. And um, Mr Mayor, previous budgets, which we have voted for, have allowed services to come back. Um, Previous budgets have allowed us to bring the environment service back. I've included and previously mentioned the um, capital paper and the investment strategy, which all members um, in the chamber at the time voted for and have voted for over numerous times. And those uh, budgets have allowed us to put significant investment into areas such as clinic cuts at Philip. And as I've said numerous times, this investment from previous budgets has paid off. Like, for example, I can announce this evening our most, independent, our most recent um, independent review by Keep Britain Tidy has seen the best ever scores we've ever seen. And I think for five average has been absolutely smashed from the amazing work that our teams do. Well, that's due to the investment that our uh, department has received thanks to this administration. And I wanna to touch on a point made about the department that was expressed earlier. It is a little rich to talk about the level of staffing the department had in 2016 or even 2015, considering the cuts your administration at the time made to the department. And you seem to miss out on some really interesting points. You don't talk about the increased cleaning staff we now have, the fact that we've got barrow beats back on the street. You don't talk about increasing ground uh, maintenance staff. 
and in fact they're now back on the tractors which you decimated and actually removed you don't talk about even the sports teams uh, sports um, officers which we now have in place which will allow them to do fantastic work on a backdrop of the active place strategy which was recently passed and is receiving um, a claim across the borough and we're having numerous conversations with our sports groups about how we can help them as we move forward through the local plan and in the future you don't talk about any of that um, council uh, Watkins, can you come to an end please i've got three minutes mr mayor you had three minutes so far i'll allow you a couple of couple of more seconds just to sum up oh i'll say mr mayor is but the um the, the budget this evening is helping those that are most needed and it's just very disingenuous to say to use reserves or to rely on government when all government money is still taxpayers' money at the end of the day, which they do seem to forget. Um, and they have not put forward any actionable points about how they would actually um, see the savings which they wish to make. Um, so I hope that members do vote for the budget this evening. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Councillor Maldoni. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's really disappointing to see this budget tonight, more of a fudget really than a budget. Um, this proposal should set out a framework for the medium term. It shouldn't just be about getting us through the next 12 months. So I agree with Councillor Kent that an opportunity has really been missed here and it's not the only one. On one hand, it's clear that government promises to fully fund the costs of responding to the COVID crisis have not been honoured. Neither has its constant promises to properly sort out and fund social care. That's why we're in this situation tonight where we're expecting um, some of the people that are suffering under this pandemic to now fund those costs. On the other hand, it's clear that local conservatives have failed and that the controversial Tory investment strategy isn't delivering the returns that they promised creating an even bigger budget problem than COVID, actually, if you look at the figures. So now the Tories have left the council caught between the devil and the deep blue sea at 40, with a 42 million financial millstone around its neck. With all this talk tonight of standing shoulder to shoulder, um, you might expect that during this year, there might have been some cross-party cooperation to try and meet some of these challenges in a way that wouldn't have pushed these costs onto our local residents. So instead of engaging with the opposition councillors on scrutiny committees, where we've been asking for financial, financial reports to come all year, so we can all do the work, the hard work of identifying sustainable cost savings agreed by all parties Instead, we've just had complete denial that there was a problem. We've had senior Conservative councillors insisting for months that Thurrock's council finances were sound and that there was no problem. I really would have more sympathy with this position if that hadn't have happened. We've, also, we've heard here how the Conservatives have failed to look at some areas where they may have been able to make sustainable savings. Um, through cuts to an overly bureaucratic management system, there are plenty of other examples. Being no doubt the Conservative councillors have completely failed local residents, and now they're going to make them pay for their mistakes. Tonight we have a budget proposal for the next year which takes money out of reserves, money out of the workforce's pockets, and lands a 5% council tax bombshell on local residents. If this increase in council tax goes through tonight, it will mean that our council tax has risen by a massive £292 or 21% since 2016. Every year, the Conservatives can you, uh, have begin put to, the council tax Can you begin up. to sum up now? You've had, you've had your three minutes, please. Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this is going to be a massive bombshell of a shock for Thurrock people and why should our local residents bear the costs of conservative financial mismanagement and incompetence? That's why I will be backing Councillor Kent's plan for a council tax freeze and vote against the council tax rises tonight. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, First of all, can I just clarify that on page 95 of the report at 2.2, .2, 
it actually says the role of the council is to agree the level of council tax and inherently the budget envelope of the council. The precise allocation of that envelope expenditure falls to the cabinet. So it's not for this Labour Council um, group to put forward your budget. We haven't had any information to be able to do so. So it's just very, very childish of you to expect us to do and put forward a budget when you won't show us what's in the budget. But for my, for, so I just needed to say that, Mr Mayor. Um, but for me, there's no doubt in my mind that this has been the most difficult year many of us have ever lived through. Families across all of our communities will have been affected financially in one way or the other due to COVID-19. Residents have lost their jobs. Some have lost their businesses that they have spent years and some decades building up. For many residents, the true effect will only begin to be felt this summer as we emerge from the lockdown and the safety nets that are, are withdrawn. I spent seven months furlough receiving 80% of my salary. Whilst it was nice for a couple of months, by the time I returned to work, I had in real terms lost over a whole month's income. I count myself lucky as some residents are still furloughed and for every month of furlough, they only get three week, weeks income from the furlough scheme. I used myself as an example because I am typical of any other family here in Thurrock that has felt the effects of COVID-19. Being a counsellor does not exempt me from the financial effects of, effects of this pandemic. Having said that, I do not have the added worry of children or young adults at home all day. Parents having to find ways of accessing tech technology, getting broadband fitted with speeds that support several devices at the same time. None of this is free. The money has to be found from reduced incomes. Utility bills have rocketed, food bills have increased and all for fam for all families. Here in Thurrock, we know that the food bank and the homeless soup kitchen have been a lifeline for many Thurrock residents over the last year. The work of the voluntary sector, the kindness of supermarkets, individuals and local community champions has meant that food parcels and sanitary products have been available for those that need it most. I do not intend to get into the slanging match and insults that often come out of these budget meetings and have again come out tonight, not from our side, I might add. I am physically tired and frustrated with, with you and that you have done this and said all of, who said this, who said that, you know, people don't care. This year, more than anything, our residents... Ca Councillor Worrell, you've had your three minutes. No, to bear that is it Can was. I just finish my speech, please? Residents really do not care who ran the council in 2010, 2016. At the moment, they just care about how they're going to get paid. What we do know... Ca ca right, Councillor Worrell, that's, that's, that's sufficient. You, but I, that's not three minutes. It is three minutes. We've got, I've got, minutes. I, I have a clock stopwatch running here. That was up, coming up to three and a half minutes now. So... Uh, We'll Mr. Mayor, you're always closing me down. I have, I take I'm, great I'm sorry, I do. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Councillor Worrell. I'm going to move now on to Councillor Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know how to follow that. Um, firstly, and I'm guessing old Labour got out and clapped for carers during the pandemic. Um, there has been a pandemic, same with my, I've forgotten that. But you're about to stab them in the back with this not voting for this through. I really can't believe, I know some of you personally, and I'm shocked that you're not gonna vote for their increases. I think it's disgusting. Um, the other side of it, uh, for Councillor Byrne, you know, you've given a lot of stick lately regarding the budget. Unfortunately, you've not produced an, another budget to put your point across. You're commenting here saying you were shut down. You went off for ages and ages. You got muted and you still not make one vague point. You did not put anything across what you would do to cover the cost. Thank you. Councillor Hewley. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Muldownley, instead of complaining, um, perhaps you could speak to the unions and get them to stick to their agreement and pay back the £800,000 that they've had so that we don't have to charge residents more for other services. 
and councillor burns you you spend your time complaining that you can't do anything because the conservatives have the majority vote well that's called democracy we're here in the majority because Tharrop residents voted for us to look after their hard-earned money they know we spend it wisely on the services that are needed the most you just complain well instead of complaining perhaps you could actually produce a budget and explain how you would supply better services and cut tax and still pay for those better services you never come up with a plan you just moan about everybody else's thank you councillor and councillor shinnock You need to, Councillor Shinnick, if you wish to speak, you need to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Over the past year, residents of Farrock have suffered. Many residents in my own ward have contacted me personally to ask me not to vote for the 5% rise in council tax. Their reasons are they don't believe they are getting good service for their money. And also, they cannot afford it. And I do believe the Tory go uh, administration is so out of touch with the general public, it's unbelievable. Mr Mayor, on behalf of the residents of Ockerden, I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Duffin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Firstly, I'd just like to say how shocked I was. I've heard the noise from the Labour Party and it, it was always, I thought, the same lines as last year. There was not a councillor within this chamber that voted against the adult social care increase. And even as someone that has actively always championed for lower taxes, giving money to frontline workers who are just in normal times going through the work they're doing in adult social care seems an important thing and something I would assume all of us support, but apparently now they're not important is the line from Labour. We, we just heard um, from Councillor Shinnick, they're not valued, they're not getting value for money. These are people we're actually talking about. And by all means, if you want to argue about the other part of the council tax rise, I get that. But the fact that you're voting against that is just reckless is the only word I can think of. And personally, yeah, I've always championed that Adult social care, fine. The other part, let's freeze that. Long term, I'd love to bring that down. But that relies on the investment strategy. And it's not any party's investment strategy. It's a unanimously voted investment strategy. Every single councillor in this chamber actively supported it. And to say anything else is a blatant, dishonest lie. And you should be ashamed of yourself if you're coming here now going, no, I never wanted that. Personally, I think the government should be doing more to assist councils in investment, bringing in alternative investment. This idea that, hey, the government should do more, they should give us more money, that's taxation. Whether it comes via the government taxation or via local taxation, it's still taxation. There just seems to be some magic money tree you shake and then the government it appears like the end of a rainbow. It's just naive, but please, the Labour Party, by all means, if you don't want to vote for the other part of the rise, the adult social care should be basic, human. How can you look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day? By all means, yeah, it is a failure of all of us. The knock-on of the pandemic, the fact that we can't push forward with the investment strategy, because I'd love to be in a position where we're not looking at the 1.99. But that 3% shouldn't even be on the table for debate. And I think you should be ashamed of yourselves if that's the solution you've got to because these are people we're talking about, not just numbers and leaflets. Thank you, Councillor Duffin. Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm not quite sure how to follow that. That was uh, quite excellent. Mr Mayor, um, firstly, I just want to add, um, or just recognise Councillor Kent's uh, rather charming summary of Farrock's people um, at the start of his uh, speech. I think we can all recognise that. I think we probably all agree with him. Now, if I go back to the start of uh, the budget discussion this evening, so between the leader and the leader of the opposition, 
There was a comment about weakness in the care system and that we have a weakness in the system. What I can't get my head around, and I simply can't, is how in the middle of an adult-centric, once-in-a-century health pandemic, that there are people that would put at risk increasing the adult social care budget up by 8% and 2.5 million. That is exactly the weakness in the care system that we have. And I cannot understand it. For the, the price to fund that is 67 pence a week, which is about a mile's bar from Tesco's. Um, which, and I'll come on to something in a moment. We, we're looking at 33 pence a week increase. I think Councillor Howden was the one who said it. That funds children and social care. That's an increase of 1.8 million. It also funds the police. You know, going back to the point, I don't know where some people have been, there is no surplus anymore because of the world that we're in, and I'll come on to that in a moment. We want to carry on funding the police, and to do that, we need to do it through our normal processes rather than surpluses. So actually every penny, by definition, apart from the environment, is either about public protection or caring for people. Now, a budget is something that we have to take on balance. I think Councillor Massey said earlier that we are it's a good place to be, that we're a low-tax council. That has challenges. It means that we earn about 13 and a half million less than others. But it, we are still £100 cheaper than South End and £265 less than Basildon. Furthermore, our increases since 2016 have all been under inflation. Now, the point I want to make now is the point that we keep talking about residents like they're a piece of academia. We know what is going on out there because most of us have been there. And that is why this Conservative administration has put in another £0.7 million to increase the local council tax benefit scheme to support the people that need it most. And I should hope you would get off your high horse and back that. Now, what we are doing is not atypical. 93 out of about 147 English councils are raising up by nearly 5%. London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, a Labour-controlled council, 5%. And I will not take lectures from Labour with respect to the London Mayor next door raising tax by 10% this year and 31% since he's been in power. We, we talk about missed opportunities. Councillor, can, can you begin to... Councillor, can you begin to wind up? Us to do what we need to do to create the, the world that we need to deal with in two years, two years' time. It is conditional. We have to do this this year to structure what we need to do. There was talk about... trade. Councillor Hebb, can you sum up, please? Yes, certainly, Mr Mayor. I think this is one thing I will close on, and that was the, what the member from Chadwell St Mary uh, seemed to revise history. Unfortunately, that same member hasn't been here long enough to have any idea what's been happening over the last 10 When her party was in control, we had year-on-year year council, council, setting. Councillor Hebb. Councillor Mr Mayor, give me two seconds, please. With respect... No, you, you're, there, there you're, was a, OK, Mr Mayor, I'll do this differently. A, a point of clarity. No, I'm, so, I'm, 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 I'm the, sorry, the, I'm sorry, Councillor Hebb. We're very pushed for time, and I've still got plenty of other members that wish to speak. So you've had more, more than three minutes, nearly four minutes now. I'm moving on. Councillor Garish. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think there has to be a certain level of, it would just shock really at the scale of what we're presented in, uh, this budget. So first off, a uh, budget gap of £42 million over the next three years. Um, and then at page 112 in the section 151 officers report, uh, which goes on to say that as current investments mature, uh, there will need to be an additional £30 million saved after 2024. So actually what we're looking at tonight is a budget gap of at least £72 million. Um, to put that into context, the council's net expenditure is only £119 million. Uh, and in other words, we have to find savings the equivalent of around 60% of our entire net budget. That's just a staggering amount and probably the worst financial outlook that this council has ever reported. And we can't say either, I think, that this is purely because of COVID-19. Uh, again, the MTFS makes clear that next year, only £6 million or so of pressures result from COVID, of which the majority is reco recovered through government grants. So we can see clearly that COVID is not the major reason for the state of the council's finances, and I think we need to ask very clearly what's gone quite so wrong. 
But Mr Mayor, I think the crucial thing that we need from this council now is a vision, a shared vision of how we can realistically begin to meet this challenge. What I want to hear is how the leader, how the portfolio holder of finance view the route forward to save that £72 million that we need to identify in the longer term. I can't see how there won't be major implications for services, um, but we're seeing so little detail on either individual cuts or on the principles that will guide those budget decisions uh, that we've got no idea what sort of council will emerge from the other side of this crisis later this decade. What we've got in front of us tonight, I think, is just very light on the detail of what comes after the current short-term cost-saving measures. And I think, Mr Mayor, this, ne this needs to be made very clear, uh, and I hope that this will be addressed in debate this evening, because ultimately, Mr Mayor, I fear that the consequences of this budget will be felt in Thurrock for very many decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Council Gerrish. Um, we've exceeded the time for debate on this subject at the moment, so I'm, I'm afraid that I can't accept any more questions on that. Councillor Gleder, do you wish to sum up? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. And, and I can see the frustration on uh, a number of the members as to have their hand up in relation to uh, wishing to speak this evening. Uh, I'll try and keep it uh, down to just the three minutes. Um, as uh, I'm going to pick on a, a few of the bits, um, just for point of clarity uh, for uh, Councillor Massey, why is the um, council tax so low? We started off with a very low base in... Um, uh, 1999, every administration, whether it be Labour or Conservative, over the years has tried to keep the council tax down to the lowest possible, whether that be under the amount of um, uh, the rate of inflation uh, or indeed uh, where we, uh, the Labour administration accepted a huge amount of government funding to be able to keep it at zero for their length of the administration, not realising that taxpayers' money, as Councillor Duffin quite rightly pointed out, is still taxpayers' money. Um, so with a low base, every time you increase it and everyone decreases it the same, uh, you still end up with the lowest um, council tax. Failing to support this budget, as I said, is going to be failing to support those most vulnerable people that as every uh, member seems to be addressing tonight. They seem to think, other than, of course, Councillor uh, Maney, who was very clear about the 90 odd percent of us that are still employed, um, that they will get that support, that £700,000 support so uh, failure to support this budget is a failure to support them. It is a failure to support uh, vulnerable um, adults who are uh, receiving uh, social care. It's a failure to support all of those low paid staff that, again, has been used as a bat and ball all evening uh, in relation to Labour not setting an alternative budget, but just playing opposition for opposition's sake. Now, the thing is, and one of those things that was raised, um, we've yeah, the Conservatives put council tax up by a whopping 20%. 10% of that is for adult social care, direct for adult social care. Half of the, um, which is half of that 20% increase that was alluded to. The other half also helped to um, support our vulnerable adults. And um, also supported vulnerable children and all the other services we've prov provided since we took over the £40 million millstone that was left with us in 2016. So what is it you want to go back to? Do you want to go back to the time of nobody working in environment where the streets were ankle deep in rubbish rather than being some of the best, as Councillor Watkins has um, uh, made clear from Keep Britain Tidy? Do you want to go back to grass not being cut in our, um, in our parks and green spaces, grass as high as an elephant's eye at places? No. What you want is you want to grab headlines, you want to say no alternatives, all you want to do is try and grab a vote grab a headline and do the least possible for your residents and the residents of Thurrock that will fall into need. The one big thing you never, ever, ever put forward, any of those that say no to this, is where your tax acts would fall. Are you thinking of cutting things like the Citizens Advice Bureau? Are you thinking of cutting the support, to the, um, uh, the, the services that are supplied, supplied by a voluntary sector? Are you looking again to cut the council tax? Um, sorry, are you going to cut the um, environment department? Um, are you going to cut the um, sports officers and Council. every other thing? Council Gladden. Background. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. So with that, I will present this budget and stick to the budget as outlined uh, in there and support the three percent council tax increase for adult social care and the one point nine nine general fund increase. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, 
It's now nearly 9.30 and I would like to move a motion without notice to sus suspend council procedure under rule 11.1 to allow meeting to continue before the, beyond the two and a half hour time limit. I, I propose that the meeting, the, sus the sus standing orders are suspended until we complete this item. So no items after item 14 will be debated or, or moved. So uh, we now move, I'll now pass over to the Chief Executive to explain the procedure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And if I could just remind um, councillors to lower their hands, please, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. It is proposed that we undertake the vote as follows this evening. We will firstly vote on recommendation 1.1. This will not be recorded unless m members indicate otherwise. We will take individual recorded votes on recommendations 1.2 and 1.3. We will take individual votes on recommendations 1.4 and 1.5, and this will not be recorded unless members indicate otherwise. And finally, we will vote on recommendations 1.6 to 1.11 on block, and this will be recorded. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to uh, raise an alternative to your suspension of standing orders, which would be to suspend standing orders to 10.30 to enable us to complete the business on the agenda. I've made my decision, Councillor, uh, Councillor Kent will suspend. Um... Mr. Mayor, it's not your decision. It's a valid point of order that I require to be voted on. OK. Uh, Councillor Kent will put it to the vote. I'll hand over to uh, those in favour right. of Councillor Kent. Right. Those in favour of Councillor Kent's motion to continue to 10.30, could you please show your hands? And those against the motion? Sorry, could I ask the people that uh, voted for the motion to make sure they've lowered their hands, please? Right, and those for the motion? Oh, sorry, are those against the motion? I've got, I've got the right, unfortunately the motion was lost, um, so we'll now move on to recommendation 1.1. So, sorry, could I ask you to lower your hands please? Right, we round, move on to recommendation 1.1. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendations made? Got the pen, the pen, 
Councillor Collins, can you confirm whether you've got your hand up or not? We can't quite. Uh... With it. I'm not against. Thank you. So, that, um, so uh, recommendation 1.1 is agreed. I'll now move on to recommendation 1.2. I will now ask Democratic Services to conduct the first recorded vote. Can members clearly indicate whether they are voting in favour, voting against or abstaining? Hand over to Democratic Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if members could just bear with us a second, we're just um, putting everybody, all the members, the ability to unmute themselves when we call the recorded vote. So uh, mm -hmm. if I could just ask members to be patient for a few seconds. Um, while we're waiting, when I call your name, uh, if you can unmute and then confirm, that would be appreciated. Okay, I, sh I shall begin. Councillor Abbas. Against. Councillor Akinbowen. For. Councillor Allen. Matthew, I agree. For. Councillor Anderson. For. Councillor Byrne. How can you vote for anything when you're not allowed to speak about the budget? I've been muted while the Tories, the mayor allowed the Tories to go over, over, over. So why are we voting on something when we're not allowed to speak? Yeah, Councillor Cox, so you can laugh, laugh and laugh and laugh. Councillor Burn, Councillor Byrne, we're asking for your vote, when you're not, not a comment. How can you vote on something where you don't... Don't vote then, just go away. <laughs> count, count. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Byrne, can we have your vote for or against? Go on! Right, if you can chime in. Move on. Uh, Councillor Chukwa. Again. Councillor Churchman. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Cockshaw. I may have been persuaded by Councillor Byrne. No, four. Councillor Duffin. Four. Councillor Fish. Against. Councillor Fletcher. Against. Against. Councillor Gerrish. <clears throat> Against. Councillor Gledhill. Four. Councillor Haig. Councillor Howden. Four. Councillor Hebb. Four. Councillor Holloway. Against. Councillor Hooper. Four. Councillor Hewlin. Four. Councillor Jeffries. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Cathy Kent. Against. Councillor John Kent. Against. Councillor Kerrin. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Lawrence, four. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lydiard. Against. Councillor Sue Little. Four. Councillor Maney. Four. Councillor Massey. Four. Councillor Mays. Four. Councillor Muldowney. Against. Councillor Okanade. Against. 
Councillor Piccolo? Or Councillor Pothicary? Councillor Pothicary? I shall move on. Uh, Councillor Potter? For. Councillor Ralph? For. Councillor Redsell? For. Councillor Rice? Against. Councillor Rigby? For. Councillor Sammons? For. Councillor Shinnick. Against. Councillor Smith. Against. Councillor Spillman. For. Councillor Van Day. I would have liked to have spoken, but uh, <laughs> disappointed. But for. Councillor Watkins. <laughs> And Councillor Worrell. Against. Right, the results are 34 the recommendation and 16 against. So the motion is carried. Moving, moving on to recommendation 1.3, I will now ask Democratic Service to conduct the recorded vote. <laughs> Can members clearly indicate, indicate whether they are voting in favour, voting against or abstaining? Councillor Abbas. Against. Against, thank you. Uh, Councillor Akinbowen. For. Councillor Allen. Against on this one, Matt, thank you. Councillor Anderson. For. Councillor Byrne. Are you need to ask? Well against, thank you. Councillor Chukwa. Again. <laughs> Councillor Churchman. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Cockshall. Four. Councillor Duffin. Four. Councillor Fish. Against. Councillor Fletcher. Against. Councillor Gerrish. Against. Councillor Gledhill. Four. Councillor Haig. Four. Councillor Howden. Four. Councillor Hebb. Four. Councillor Holloway. Against. Councillor Hooper. Four. Councillor Hewlin. Four. Councillor Jeffries. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Cathy Kent. Against. Councillor John Kent. Against. Councillor Kerrin. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Lydiard. Against. Councillor Little. Four. Councillor Maney. Four. Councillor Massey. Against. Councillor Mays. Four. Councillor Muldowney. 
Against. Councillor Okanadi. Against. Councillor Piccolo. Oh. Councillor Pothikerry. Against. Councillor Potter. For. Councillor Ralph. For. Councillor Redsell. For. Councillor Rice. Against. Councillor Rigby. For. Councillor Sammons. For. Councillor Shinnick. Against. Councillor Smith. Against. Councillor Spillman. For. Councillor Van Day. For. Councillor Watkins. For. And Councillor Worrell. Against. Recommendation 1.3 is carried. Now moving on to recommendation 1.4. Is any member in disagreement with the recommended recommendations made? Please Rose, please. Right, no, the recommendation is carried. Moving on to recommendation 1.5. Is any member in disagreement with the recommendation made? No, no that, that motion is, that uh, recommendation also carried. <clears throat> Recommendations 1.6 to 1.11 we will vote and block and ask Democratic Service con con to conduct a recorded vote. I'll pass over to Democratic Services. Councillor Abbas. For. Councillor Akin Bowen. For. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Anderson. For. Councillor Byrne. I'll pass on that one. Abstain. Sorry, I didn't catch that, Councillor. Could you confirm? Oh, abstain. abstain. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass on that one. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Chukwa. For. Councillor Churchman. For. Councillor Collins. For. Councillor Cockshall. Four. Councillor Duffin. Four. Councillor Fish. Four. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Gerrish. Four. Councillor Gledhill. Four. Councillor Haig. Four. Councillor Howden. Four. Councillor Hebb. Four. Councillor Holloway. Four. Councillor Hooper. Four. Councillor Hewlin. Four. Councillor Jeffries. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Kathy Kent. Four. Councillor John Kent. Four. Councillor Kerrin. Four. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Councillor Lydiard. Four. Councillor Little. Four. Councillor Maney. Four. 
Councillor Massey. Oh. Councillor Mays. Councillor Mays. I'll move on. Councillor Muldowney. Four. Councillor Okanade. Four. Councillor Piccolo. Four. Councillor Pothikerry. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. Councillor Ralph. Four. Councillor Redsell. Four. Councillor Rice. Four. Councillor Rigby. Four. Councillor Salmons. Four. Councillor Shinnick. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Spillman. Four. Councillor Van Day. Four. Councillor Watkins. Four. And Councillor Worrell. Four. And just just go back to Councillor Mays. Four. Sorry, you put me as an attendee, so I couldn't unmute. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, the item is carried. Um, that uh, brings us to the end of the uh, meeting. Um, just like to thank everybody for their indulgence and uh, the next time we'll be uh, seeing one another is hopefully in in May so uh, as I said at the start of the meeting thank you for all of you that have given your service and maybe for whatever reason aren't here uh, in, uh, for the main meeting and also and every success um, to those that are up for re-election in May so thank you very much and with that I conclude the meeting at 2151.